Welcome to the 17th episode of Cartoon Avatars. I'm your host, Logan Bartlett, and I am joined today by a special guest, uh, Benedict Evans. Ben, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you doing this. So we're recording uh, Eastern time, morning Friday, which is uh, late afternoon, your time in the UK. Sure. So yeah, I appreciate you squeezing me in. No problem. Uh, always good to chat about this stuff. Where in the where were you traveling this week? Uh, Dublin, Hamburg, and Marbella. Um, nice. Of, of which I would definitely choose Hamburg. Is that right? I've actually never been to Hamburg. It's a quite a nice city. Lots of canals and rivers, and you know, interesting stuff to do. Um, it does have that kind of German element, wherein the the Italian restaurant is called Italian restaurant. Um, I like that with with, Ita- I, uh... with Italian specialities. I found Germans to be the most uh, to be the most welcoming of Americans. Uh, like from a when, whenever I visited, they've uh, they see, and I don't know what exactly that is. I found if there's a spectrum of like Bar- uh, Spain and Barcelona on one end, and I think Germany's on the other. London's like a little close to Germany, uh, but uh, mm. or UK mm. in general. But yeah, I found Spain was the most hostile of any city I've ever visited. Uh, consistently, right? It's like. Mm. Oh, you don't speak Catalan? Do you speak Spanish at least? And I'm like, you know, I mean, enough, right? I'm sorry I don't speak your like language spoken by whatever, 500,000 people local to Barcelona, but. No, I, it's funny you say that. I've been going to, I went to Barcelona every year for like at least 10 years to go to Mobile World Congress and um, never had that problem. Maybe it's because I, you know, I'm, I'm English, so I just kind of presume everybody else is inferior, I think that's right. is inferior anyway. Like, yeah, exactly. I mean, they're, 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 all, they're all Spanish, so who cares? Yeah, exactly. Your moral superiority just reigns supreme. And 500,000, I, I lied. I just looked it up. It's 9 million people speak Catalan. So I, uh, a, a little condescending. Um, the the but... funny thing about, I mean, this is San Francisco talking to the, the West Coast. The funny thing about Barcelona actually is that it feels like so much more bigger a city than San Francisco when it's actually roughly the same population. Is that is that a density thing? I didn't realize it was the same yeah. population. I, I so I'm in New York and I've I've yeah. I've actually been able to make it uh, whatever twelve years in tech and eight years in venture without ever living in San Francisco. And so it's yeah. funny people like say very San Francisco centric things. Uh, like I I actually just don't even know the city that well. Um, yeah. Like where to get around and local restaurants and all that or traffic. There's not, there's not much to know. Totally. So maybe for folks that don't know, you're, you're probably not listening to this podcast if you don't uh, know Ben. But maybe give a little bit of a primer on uh, your your background and what you're up to today. Sure. So in order, I spent the first sort of five years of my career in equity research, um, sell side equity research, covering mobile and technology. So I started what year is my this? job. So I started in ninety spring of ninety nine. So for about nine months, I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. And then it wasn't for three or four years. Um, and then I worked in um, strategy and BD, in sort of media and telecoms companies, and did some consulting. And then in beginning of 14, 2014, went out to the Valley to work for Andreessen Horowitz, which is a medium-sized private equity firm. I've heard of them. Otherwise known as Benmark. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and so you were there for six-ish years, five and a half years? Yeah, so yeah, so I was there until 2019, end of 2019, and then I moved back to London. I spent the whole of my career otherwise in London, mostly. Moved back to London to do my own thing um, just as the pandemic started. And you, um, I mean, you're, you became known, I guess, uh, from, you have a newsletter you do weekly. Is that right? Like maybe, maybe take through, uh, when you started doing that and, uh, yeah, I mean, you have whatever. Yeah. There's a content. Yeah. Yeah. There's a a content story here. So I, from sort of 2000, I'm going to get the dates wrong, but sort of 2009 ish. I was working sort of semi-independently, so I was spending most of my time with a boutique research firm in London, but I was also sort of independent, which meant that I was free to publish stuff on the internet if I wanted to. Whereas if I'd been working at Bernstein or McKinsey or um, a big PE firm or something or a VC firm or tech company or whatever, I wouldn't have been free to publish stuff on the internet or it would have gone through compliance and marketing and everything else. And so I was sort of relatively unusual in that I was someone from a sort of an analysis and strategy industry in the smartphone world, 
um, who was able to talk about this stuff. And so this is at the time when the smartphone wars are in full flood and everyone's like looking at BlackBerry's quarterly results and so on. And most people in tech at that point didn't quite know that like people publish quarterly reports and told you what the unit numbers were because like normally tech companies didn't do that, but in mobile they did. And so I think it was basically me and Horace Dedu, um, were kind of, we were posting charts every time Apple had results and talking about what was going on. And so kind of got noticed in that sense, because not many other people, like there were plenty of other people who knew about it, but they weren't allowed to publish stuff. And so I was on Twitter, I have a blog, um, and then um, in early 2013, I started a weekly email newsletter, which is sort of before, obviously, long after people started doing email newsletters, which go back to the, well, 18th century or something, um, if you count newslet newsletters, um, but before the kind of current Substack wave. Um, and so I started a free weekly newsletter at the beginning of 2013, which has grown in more or less a straight line ever since, and now has about 175,000 subscribers. Um, and it's sort of, and it's not actually a blog every week. It's actually here are 10 or 15 things I saw this week are interesting in a paragraph about what I thought about them and why they mattered or why they were dumb or why they were interesting. Um, and so there's a sort of a virtuous circle, or there's a Twitter account, there's a blog, and then there's a, the newsletter that kind of ties it all together. And then I do kind of an annual macro trends presentation that I publish as well, which is sort of charts and storytelling. Yeah. Um, so I try and work out what's interesting and what to talk about, basically. It's an interesting uh, story. We've had uh, Ben Thompson on uh, two weeks ago or whatever, sort of talking about his journey. And I feel like you two uh, were kind of taking different paths around the same time of, you know, tech and strategy, right? When there weren't a lot of people. Now, I mean, I feel like there's a near endless number of people that are opining on tech and strategy, but uh, it felt like for a while it was you plus, I don't know, John Gruber and a handful of other people that were that Yeah, were and like John Gruber, Ben Thompson, Ben Baharan, in fact, Ben Baharan, Ben Thompson and I did a sort of podcast called Ben Squared, I think in 2013, before before I joined A16Z and had like the corporate calls team. Um, um, but I stopped to that um, and well, had, to, had to do everything under the A16Z umbrella, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were relatively few people who kind of had some understanding of how this stuff worked and were able to talk in public. That was kind of the crucial point. Like, there were way more people know, know more about, and particularly anything I talk about, there's way more people know more about semis than I do or know more about well, the mechanics of the app store than I do. Um, but most of them work at Apple or more, you know, work at Qualcomm or whatever and can't talk about it. And also aren't like, you know, I haven't spent 20 years actually doing analysis and thinking about how you would tell a story and how you'd explain stuff. Um, there's a line from a, um, there was a New Yorker writer in the thirties and forties called AJ Liebling, who said that he could write better than anyone who wrote faster and faster than anyone who wrote better. Um, so I think there's a sort of, there's something in that. I like that. That's good. Uh, and so Andreessen, um, you were there for, for six years kind of doing, yep. what, what was your role for them when you were there? So I suppose a couple of things. So one of them is a big part of the Andreessen model is everything they do after the investment. Um, yep. you know, that I think when I joined, there were sort of 80 people and probably 20 of those were doing deals directly and everyone else was post investment. And so, and a big piece of that is what they call the briefing center, which is big company comes to the Valley, spends an afternoon at the A16Z office, meets a dozen portfolio companies that have been sort of pre-selected by A16Z based on sort of what sort of mutual interest with a view to becoming customers of those companies. Um, and so the idea is obviously for the portfolio companies, um, it means, you know, it's much more efficient than flying all around the country. And also it's like, we already know the Caterpillar CIO. We already know the Citibank CIO, so we can make those introductions and put you in the room. And obviously for those companies, it was sort of pre-selected in that, like the companies that they were seeing were at least moderately sensible and that we'd invested in them. Um, and so I would sort of sit in those meetings and talk to them about, well, what's this machine learning thing or what's this smartphone thing? Um, and then I sat obviously with sort of one seat in the deal, one leg of my chair, sitting in the deal review, looking at startups and looking at what was going on and looking at investments and, you know, every now and then saying something, um, in the kind of discussion around a, a potential investment. Um, and then the third piece, which is sort of an, also another way of describing a 16 C is it sort of unbubbles the general partner. So, you know, to that operating model, instead of does Mark know somebody at Citibank, does Ben know somebody at Caterpillar, it's no, there's a whole team of 20 people whose job is to know that. There's a whole team whose job is to know how to find you a CTO, whose job is to 
help you think about what your comms are and so on. And so I was sort of somewhere in that model in that, you know, I was going and, you know, explaining stuff instead of Ben and Mark or, or Alex or whoever having to get on a plane and go and explain stuff. Yeah. Got it. No, it makes sense. Uh, well, good. And so today you're, uh, so you left in uh, the beginning of the pandemic and today you're, the newsletter keeps on keeping on. It's, you're a venture partner at a few different uh, funds. You also have a podcast of your own. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, so there's a newsletter itself, which where there's now a, a paid version, which has done okay. Um, it's converted. I mean, so I met somebody the other day and said, it's amazing. You've got 175,000 paying subscribers to your newsletter. And I'm like, yeah, if I had 175,000 paying subscribers, I would not be in this city today. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. <laughs> I would be living in Vegas and community world. Yeah, like I had a separate conversation. Um, so there's a, a percentage of that has converted to paid and then there's sponsorship in the free one. And so that's a business. And then I have a bunch of sort of advisory roles at a bunch of companies and that's a thing. And then I go and speak at events, which is also sort of an interesting thing to do. Um, I always find like the, um, the, the more less people know about tech, the more interesting questions they ask. Yeah, it's interesting. Sort of from a first principle standpoint of like, hey, why yeah. does any of this exist? We sort of come from an assumed baseline of like, you know, all right, yeah. well, because all of this we all know, right? And you don't actually poke and prod the questions like at a layer deeper. Yeah. Well, you get the like the dumb questions, so to speak, actually can, can often be surprisingly hard to answer, which is kind of useful. Yeah, totally. Maybe you like you don't start from a foundational principle of like the app store yeah. as a thirty percent take rate or whatever. It's like why you know why does the app yeah. store need to exist at all, right? And it sort of takes you back mm. to like the primitives of yeah, all that stuff. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So those are so I sort of do those things, and then there's a sort of there's a thread running through all of it, which is I suppose what's the interesting thing to talk about now? I mean, you always have to sort of climb up the tree rather than out along one branch. Um, so you know if. You know, I'm not still talking about the app store and smartphones because like it happened, you know, that was the center of the tech industry for sort of five to seven years. And now it happened. Five billion people give or take have got a smartphone. Like it's done. Next question. Yeah. Um, in fact, in fact, the interesting part of sort of, sort of one of the challenges, both sort of professionally, but also sort of an interesting topic is that like there isn't a next question. Well, there certainly isn't, there is, certainly isn't one. I, well, certainly, I mean, when you talk very literally the center of the tech world, uh, we'll get there in a second, but that's obviously Elon Musk. But when you move beyond that, right, like what is the next platform or what is the next um, shift that's occurring? Mm. And it's, I don't know, I mean, Ben Thompson and I have talked about like, you can chase down the rabbit hole of ATT and regulation and all that stuff, right? But that's that's the back nine to use the golf analogy. Like we're, we're sort of at the end state and we know it's going to play out with different machinations or whatever, but what is the frontier, the new technological shift? And obviously there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going to happen, but all that stuff's inevitable, right? It's like mm. cloud on-prem is going to move to cloud or like, you know, whatever, uh, all this stuff, the, the social apps are going to get litigated and broken up in part, mm. and there's going to be new competitors and all that stuff. But it is interesting. Like what is that new frontier that we're going to chase after from a technological shift? I mean, Bitcoin and crypto and Web three is kind of the logical. Yeah. Well, well, you know, if if um, if, if if Chris Dixon was all this and hadn't already blocked us both, then he would be saying it's Web three dummy. Um, yes. And exactly. certainly for kind of crypto people, it is. I mean, they sort of so winding back a second. So I think there's certainly kind of to some extent there's kind of an enterprise consumer thing here, because from the enterprise side, the curve isn't smartphone. The curve is cloud, and we're kind of halfway through that curve. Yes, but, but so they, there isn't, they're kind of the, following and, the same trajectory of inevitability, right? Like it's going to happen. Yeah, but that's, like, but that's like smartphones in like 2012. It's like, this is the thing. We've got another 10 years of cloud. And then from that, many other things flow, which is A, all the kind of, well, what is the infrastructure and the software and security model and all the, all the enterprise IT stuff within that. And then the other is like a kind of a very deterministic way. It's like, how many different ways can you unbundle Excel and unbundle Salesforce? and unbundle the email and turn it into some vertical application. And the answer is thousands and thousands of times, um, like doing something inside some department of every big company that it would never occur to you as a thing. And it turns out that's like a $10 billion company. Yes. And exactly. so for, for on that side, like the curve is, you know, at a 45 degree angle up and there's not like, it's easy. It's more kind of on the consumer side. I think it's harder to say like, what's the next fundamental shift because social has sort of happened, search happened, smartphones have happened. Um, and on the one side, like you've got, and as I'm sure Ben would say, like you've got this kind of massive deployment stage. So, you know, whether that's Shopify on the one hand, Shein on the other, 
Um, I mean, this is the, I said, I do an annual presentation. I do this presentation I did where I basically said there's sort of three things going questions. There's all the stuff for 2030, which is basically Web3, Metaverse, plus like frontier tech, like quantum and satellites and shit. Meanwhile, everyone in software is building digital transformation, so they're building cloud. And meanwhile, everyone outside of tech is getting messed up by ideas from 2000, like maybe people will buy stuff online, which is basically what Sheehan is. You know, there's nothing in Sheehan that you couldn't have said 10 years ago. It's just, guess what? They did it right, and it's now bigger than Zara and H&M combined. So with TikTok, like there's nothing in TikTok that people weren't trying to do 10 years ago with Vine. It's just they did it right, and it's whatever it is, a $100 billion company. Um, the other side of that is, you know, does Web3, it's like Web3, like the new cloud, the new open source, the new architectural layer where we re completely remake the whole of the internet or great half of the internet. Um, and if it is, that gets complicated because like open source did take over tech, but the iPhone isn't open and Microsoft owns GitHub. So it's probably a little more complicated. And then there's a the metaverse thing, which is like, hey, what the fuck does metaverse even mean? Yeah. Sorry, can I swear on your, can I swear yeah, on your yeah, podcast? Yeah, 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 no, 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 no. Yeah, fuck okay. shit. All that stuff's good. Yeah, so in Germany, shit show is like a normal word that you can put on the front page of a newspaper. So there's just that's this kind of shit show, and it's just like a normal like mainstream word. Yeah, hopefully we can normalize all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so there's meta like the metaverse is just like this incredibly. On the one hand, it's super specific. Everyone will have VR and AR in ten years, which is kind of like and say, well, what would that mean? It's kind of like trying talking about mobile in two thousand. Like everyone will have an interconnected phone in ten years okay but what um and on the other hand it's just incredibly vague because people start using it to describe like literally people are using metaverse to describe web 2 web 1.0 things totally yeah it's so i'm sure it's funny for you to have like the perspective of being in mobile as a dedicated focus in 99 or whatever that's one of the things i always come back to is no idea is new like everyone's thought of all of these ideas it's just mm. like it is now going to be the time that it actually works. And I had asked uh, Aaron Levy last week about Web3 and, you know, his view of all that stuff. And he was like, I kind of reject the premise of the question that like Web3 is a thing, right? He like took it back to the root of like, hey, do I believe in decentralization and protocols and all that stuff? Sure. But like, does it need that everyone's accruing value and the last in should make money because of this appreciation mm. and all that stuff? I... I to some extent, I hope, I mean, it's good for my business uh, in investing in tech companies if if like Web3 and crypto proves to be uh, a thing just because we're going to unbundle a lot of the like. You'll have a whole wave of company creation. Yeah. I mean, it's bad that like, you know, I'm, I, I've made enough jokes about like uh, Bitcoin being for drug dealers and I'm blocked by like a lot of the influencers in the crypto mm. world. So that part of it's bad. But in terms of like entrepreneurial uh, opportunity, I think it's great if that happens. It's just like, it's not clear to me that that is a thing or metaverse. I mean, it sort of feels like grasping at straws a little bit. Both of them are kind of problems that like no one totally asked for, right? And it's, I, I think I could see it actually happening, but we're not, I don't know, we're like, no one's really saying this is a pain point that is acute today and that these are the discrete ways mm -hmm. of solving it other than maybe a store of value from crypto or gaming for metaverse. Yeah. I mean, I just, there, I, there was a, a moment a few months ago where I felt like every crypto conversation was basically people arguing about how to argue about crypto. So it's like, well, you can't, this is a toy. Yes, but everything looks like a toy. Yeah. Yes, but stuff that didn't work looked like a toy too. So what are you telling me? This doesn't work yet, but it's been 10 years and it doesn't work yet. Well, look, remember when that, what's that guy, the Ruby on Rails got troll, David yeah. something, DHA, where he wrote this famous thing saying, you know, Facebook hasn't made money yet, so it never will. This is not, you know, there's an awful lot of like arguments that aren't useful. Yeah, well, it's it's sort of solving for survivorship bias of like yeah, but 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 every argument works both ways, and this kind of useful and each of the counter argument is useless too. I mean, there's this great line by a um a, this physicist called Wolfgang Pauli, who was he's one of these guys with lots of stories about them, and you know, it's like mathematicians, it's the same thing. Do you retain quotes pretty well, by the way? I mean, you you have all these things off the uh, off the cuff. Yeah, it's the it's the autism that does it. Um, <laughs> so so um, but yeah, there's a um, the story is that he was asked to look at somebody's some student's work, and the, the guy's showing it to him says, I, "It's probably not. I'm afraid it's not very good." And Wolfgang Pauli says, "It's worse than that. It's not even wrong." <laughs> like which that. meant which he meant like it wasn't a thesis that you could test. 
you couldn't show that it was wrong. It didn't like reach the level of being something that you could test and see whether it was right or wrong. And so these kind of arguments like, well, that looks like a toy. Everything looks like a toy. People always say that toys didn't like it's just, it, you're not adding anything to this. And I think a lot of those sort of, it doesn't work yet. It should be working by now. What problem is it solving? Like you could apply all of those to, you know, the internet or to the web or to open source or smartphones. What problem is smartphone solving? Well, now we could tell you. Yeah. Um, no, no, 2005, not a remotely obvious that like no one knew, would not have had a universal agreement that this was a thing that we needed at all. Um, I mean, I think my, you know, I think it's a struggle. I find it a struggle to talk about crypto, maybe for kind of two ways. The first struggle I have is that it seems sort of like talking about Linux in the late 90s or early 90s, in that all the conversations are either very, very technical where I have nothing to add. And even if I learned it all, maybe I wouldn't be able to add anything. And even if I did, no one outside, a very small number of people would care. So it's not like a good investment in my time as a sort of a single person, single businessman, um, single business person. Um, so it's like, you're either arguing about what kernel memory management should you use, or you're saying in 30 years time, maybe mobile phones will run on Linux. So yeah. Which your answer is maybe, but like, like this, is not, this is not useful. And it's the same. I, I've said that like, both the smartest and dumbest people I know yeah. are all in on Yeah, which I quote you on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, so this is, and this is the problem talking in crypto. It's either very, very, very technical, and it's all like, well, which level two chain, and do we go to L3? Or it's like, in the future, there'll be no countries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a, which is, well, you know, maybe, but like, that's 20 years ago. So like, what can we, was there anything useful we can say about that? Um, I mean, the other... There's that IQ spectrum graph where in the middle, it's like someone really angry and on either side, it's like, you know, the bell curve of dumb and super Yeah, smart. exactly. Like, there's nothing, like, there's, there's nothing, I mean, I had this conversation with people in other industries that, you know, in, there are other industries where in 10 years is sort of the next product cycle. Like if you're in real estate, you know, or if you're building a dam or something, 10 years is like, that's the point it comes online and we've already booked the party. Um, yeah. Whereas in tech, 10 years is right on the edge of science fiction. It's not totally. like... Yeah. 15 years is like, definitely I, science fiction. I saw a quote that someone or like someone was joking that uh, a, a VC that's prognosticated about the downturn that's come has been right, has rightly predicted 10 of the last two uh, recessions. Yeah, I mean, this is this is an old joke. It's an old joke about economists. Yes. You know, you know economists always have all economists correctly predict 10 of the last five recessions. Yeah. Um, I mean, the other the, the other I mean, the the the, the thing that I you know, I sort of poke away and thinking like, what is the thing that I would write, which is sort of how that would be useful, that would be at the right level of abstraction to think about crypto. Um, the, the thing that, the thing that I keep going back to is thinking about open source. Um, and one has to be kind of cautious of, you know, argument reasoning by metaphor, but the open source people were convinced they were going to transform software. And it was this wild, crazy, very, very religious idea. And you still have vestiges of the religion, you're like Richard Stallman refusing to use a computer that doesn't have an open source BIOS. To which your answer is like, yes, but have you audited the mask for the photo lithography to make the chip? It's like, you know, where did the sand come from? Um, so you've got this very kind of religious idea and they were thought they were going to destroy Microsoft and no one was ever going to buy Office, no one would buy Windows, everyone would write their own code. And here we are 25 years later and the whole tech industry runs on open source and it's absolutely central to the way everything works. And yet the iPhone isn't open. And yet the iPhone has mil is full of open source, isn't open, has millions of apps. So what is it? Is it open or not? What do you mean by not open? Um, and so I have that sort of question of like, does Web3, and it's, it's kind of to your point, like, does everybody think have to have money attached to it? Does everyone have to know they're using Web3? Because with open source, obviously you don't. It's a way of building software, but it doesn't really fundamentally change what the software is. It just kind of changes what it, how it works and how it got built and what the business model is. But the software, as a consumer, you don't need to know the software with open source. And so with web, with, if you were to build Twitter or Instagram or Web3, and that's like kind of a crap metaphor because the stuff you build with a new thing is never the old yeah, thing. It's, it's something the new. Thing. Yeah, except for, except for Salesforce, which is just Siebel in the cloud. But for the most part, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but like, but you know, if you were to build some new thing that really, really worked because it was Web3, would I as a consumer have to know it was Web3? And would I have, how deeply would I have to dig into all the Web3 specific stuff? And the, the problem in a sense is probably yes, because otherwise it wouldn't be Web3. Like, what would that mean? Um, 
And I don't know, I haven't, I haven't really got a good answer to that. I mean, the, another way of coming at it, though, maybe might be that if, for example, um, LVMH, which I think is, is really one of the most interesting companies in the world right yep. now, um, if LVMH, for the sake of argument, do an NFT thing, and rather like the kind of microcosm of crypto, all the arguments about NFTs are dumb. Um, but well, most of the arguments about NFTs are dumb. But if, 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 if LVMH does, a, does an NFT thing, and they decide they're going to have a golden share or they're going to have 51%. Well, Bitcoin people would say, this is, is dumb. This isn't, you could just use SAP for that. But LVMH would say, yes, but you have composability and transparency. So you can see what the, you can see what the contracts are. You can see the transactions. It's composable. We're the only people who can change the rules, but all the other stuff is very crypto and very web three. You know, what if you were to, you know. Um, encrypt it so that it wasn't composable, making stuff up here. Like, you know, make your matrix of all the things that define that you can only do because it's Web3. Now, what if you were to turn some of those off for some reason? Would it still be Web3? What if the is not transparent to the user, but it's running one layer down? Does that mean, like, this is sort of how open source evolved, which is like all the business, it all got kind of complicated and interesting. Um. And the vision, the religion, I mean, I think Eric Raymond kind of wrote a thing saying, you know, we've got face it, desktop Linux is lost, but actually we kind of won if you look at what happened to open source, which is, you know, a legitimate point of view. That's sort of the, the, the open source question, the, sorry, the, 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 the crypto question is when you strip away all the bullshit of like, everyone will move to Singapore and there'll be no more countries anymore. And this will change how trade unions work. What will it actually be once it's become absorbed into the tech industry? Yeah, and will, will you be aware of it? And the, my hard part with it is asking these questions of stuff ultimately puts you on a, you know, a block list or a cynic list of all this. And I don't know, it's kind of fundamental, like even you, you have to be 100 percent in and anything less than that is like you're not going to make it uh, in that whole attitude. And it's, just, it's it's hard to have, you know, good faith conversations with people if, if you if you can't agree on principles uh, around this. So, yeah, so there's sort of, there's something of this in conversations about Tesla, because you can make a point, which is something that Elon has said, and people will say, you're an idiot, you're saying you've been no better than Tesla. Like, there are all these Tesla Elon fanboys who actually don't know anything about Tesla or Elon or anything he said or done or anything the company's done. And so you get, and which actually makes it quite hard to have a Twitter conversation about Tesla because you've just got all these reply guys jumping up and down like those little yellow people in Minions movie. Um, and I think Bitcoin is kind of the same. I mean, if you just, if you do a logged out search on A16Z on Twitter, it's completely insane. And I say this as somebody who used to work there, but it's like, you know, everything's, and, it, and it's like a generalized problem with crypto is it's like the scene in, in Monty Python and the life of Brian, where they're talking about how every, they hate everyone. You know, the only people we hate more than the Judean people's front are the people's front of Judea. And, you know, everything in Bitcoin is like this. Everything is a scam. Everything is an idiot. Everyone is a crook. Everything's stupid, except your scheme. And of course, and then of course, people who are in crypto think everything's stupid and a scam and idiots. And so Bitcoin is like, you know, the George New, like new George Soros, evil, like mastermind, criminal, self-demon. Like there's just an enormous amount of bullshit. Um, and one of the reasons I mention that is like, the amount of the increase in the amount of crap that I got when I joined A16Z and the way that basically disappeared when I left was kind of interesting. And some of it was my fault and what I was talking about, but a lot of it was like, you work at A16Z therefore. And so with all of which is kind of a long winded, winded way of saying, like, I think if you worked in crypto at A16Z and you're on Twitter, you just, you'd like, you would just really wear out your block button. Yeah, and you really would. And so I have a quite a lot of sympathy for, for Dixon and so on for like, they get the, you know, a, yeah, they overblock and yeah, like there's a bunch of not very good arguments that come out from there sometimes, but like, it's tough to have a, a good faith conversation about this stuff on Twitter. Yeah, that's interesting. Really I mean, is. in general, it's hard to have good faith conversations on Twitter. I think a uh, hard stop, but I, I, I agree with that. Maybe just cause you brought it up. It's a good segue, uh, to Elon and Twitter. So I, I, I can't decide if I'm tired about talking about this subject or, uh, or it's something that we just need to talk about, but, uh, 
um, just to give a quick primer on the last week here for Elon. So I guess last Friday, a week ago, Musk was questioning the uh, less than 5% bots that existed on the platform. And he said the deal was temporarily on hold. Uh, a couple hours later, he came out and said he was committed to the acquisition, which I assume some lawyer forcibly made him tweet out. Um, and then at the All In conference on Monday, uh, Musk gave at best a tepid response to his desire to even go through with the deal. Justin, I don't know if you want to queue up that audio here and we'll let people listen in. Um, you didn't, oh, the one question. Are, is this Twitter deal going to get closed, do you think? What are the chances here? Well, I mean, it really depends on, on, a, on a lot of factors here. Um, I'm still waiting for uh, some sort of uh, logical explanation for the number of sort of fake or spam accounts on Twitter. Um, and Twitter is, is refusing to tell us. Uh, so, you know, this just seems like a strange thing. Um, Wait, sorry, is, are they refusing to tell you or you don't think they really know? I mean, there's a good chance they may just have no idea. They claim that they do know. Yeah. And they claim that they've got this complex methodology uh, that only they can understand. Um, <laughs> So, so obviously not the most glowing endorsement uh, there that he's going to move forward with the with the deal. Um, it seems like Twitter's board is going to move forward, uh, or at least planning to move forward. They're com they said they were committed to completing the transaction on the agreed upon price and terms. Um, and this is all with a backdrop, I guess, of Tesla stock is down twenty five percent plus, which has wiped out about forty five billion dollars of value. Uh, to Musk personally. Yeah, apparently, apparently the stock market has gone down a bit lately. I don't know if you, well, you've seen I, some stories about this. I actually lived it in a bunch of different ways. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Snapchat's down 28%, uh, which would imply instead of the 54.20 that Musk is paying, that would imply like a $39 price per share. Uh, and then perhaps coincidentally, perhaps not, Bloomberg reported that SpaceX is in talks to raise at $125 billion valuation. And then the last thing on Musk this week uh, that I don't particularly want to touch is uh, accusations from a masseuse. Yeah, about there's, a, there's a sexual harassment lawsuit. Yes. 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 So, and we'll leave, um, it, we'll leave it at that. What, all, all, what's your perspective on this whole thing in general, like the last week as well as the whole saga? So... So there's a securities conversation here as, as a long time ago, I actually was an equity analyst, which is that Elon doesn't act like a public company CEO, yes. doesn't really care what the rules are, um, and mostly gets away with it. And you could argue like the whole funding secured thing in the end, the price went up so much afterwards that the shareholders didn't really suffer for that. But there's kind of reasons why you're not supposed to just fuck with people yeah. and you're not supposed to fuck with the shareholders and you're not supposed to lie. Um, those rules are kind of there for a reason. Um, and it's kind of not okay to just pick and choose which ones you feel like obeying um, and, you know, and mess about, mess around with it. So I think that's, you know, that's kind of a, a, maybe a political opinion. No, no, I mean, I, Matt Levine had a really but good like, thing this week about like, you know, calling it what it was. He's like, Musk is lying about this stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, it's very kind of Trumpian in a sense in that he's just ignoring what the norms are and daring the regulator to do something about it and kind of dancing all over the edge of the line between, you know, what you're not supposed to do, an actual securities fraud or whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's the whole, and that's nothing to do with tech or test or, or Twitter. It's just, you know, how he, how he, how he's behaved and a bunch of other issues here. I mean, I had a, a tweet about it where I said, you know, basically the problem with Elon is he's a bullshitter who delivers. So he says all this stuff and he does all this stuff and there's a self-landing rocket ship and there's a scale, first scale yeah, company yeah, yeah. since the Second World War. It's not MLM um, <laughs> or it's not a Ponzi scheme if you actually make good on what you promise. Or, or, right? Well, except that half of it is. The other half doesn't turn up. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're still waiting for the self-driving girl. Um, and we, you know, he's, you know, he says a bunch of stuff and then there's the self-flying and there's the rocket ship. Yeah. Um, and so that's, and that's the kind of the generalized problem with it with, 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 with because I mean, that kind of breaks people's pattern recognition, because you've got to understand that both of those are true. Um, he is full of shit and there's the rocket ship. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so that's the kind of sort of, sort of second sort of Elon point. I think, you know, the Twitter, I mean, you know, the challenge with Twitter has always been, um, so maybe this is the two points here. The first point is like Twitter has always been known as this place where good people would go and they would fail to get anything done and they would leave and they would get something done. So somebody I knew worked there 
um, and he had a child that his, he and his wife had a baby and he left and he had twins. And I said, Kevin, you doubled your productivity, uh, which is kind of the, the, like the archetype of the Twitter experience. And, and, and you hear all these like amazing stories of what a shambles it was sort of 15 years ago and 10 years ago. And you hear those stories, but I also sort of hear those stories like now of what a mess it is. And so there's certainly an argument. Now you could argue like, is the contrast with Instagram? So there's, so let me wind back, right? There's always been this kind of problem and it's actually really hard to define what it is, what the new experience should be. You have to spend months working on it in order to build value and build a followers. You join, you've got an empty screen, you tweet, no one sees it. You're shouting into the void. Yep. It's a really hard experience relative to something like Instagram. And you could argue, is the reason it's such a mess because it's so hard? Or does it just look hard because it's such a mess? Yeah, it's hard and to the know. Because it's TikTok, is probably both. TikTok has figured this out in an onboarding funnel way yeah. where, it, you know, it is an interest graph as well, but they figured out that funnel in a much but, more meaningful way. But it's easier. It's a, a much easier kind of content to look at. Yes, I much more use thesis. Yeah. It's easier to look at videos and pictures than to scan a bunch of people's tweets and work out whether you would want to follow them. It's just, there is this kind of chicken and egg. Is Does it look so hard because the company's never really been any good at working it out or vice versa? And I think the answer is probably a bit of both. Yeah. Um, but whatever it is, the company's always been a mess. Um, and you see this with like product now. I mean, what was it like Matthew Ball the other day tweeted that someone tried to fish him, um, with a DM from a verified account that obviously been hacked and he hits the report button and it goes to a 404 and they're like, come on. Yeah. There's 5,000 people work there. This is a 15 year old company. Your report phishing goes to a 404. Like, come on. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's a story why, yeah, there's always a story why. So. And so there's a, you know, I think that, you know, Elon, I hate Steve Jobs metaphors are sort of massively overused, but you know, there's a sort of, you know, the, the, the Steve Jobs going back to Apple is on the first hand, on the one first hand, it's a massively badly run company, chaotic company. And so the first thing you have to do is fix it and not have like too many models in the wrong inventory and stuff be out of stock and stuff be screwed up. But the second thing is, yes, but you've still lost. Uh, Apple's still lost, even if you were, were, were running it properly. So then what? Yep. And it takes them a while to work out the then what, which they think for a while is going to be video. And then of course it's the iPod and then music. And then the iPhone comes like a decade after we went back. Um, and so the same thing for Apple, for, for, for Tesla, there's certainly like a fixing the company story. And then, but then there's a, why is this 200 million downs and $5 billion of revenue? And it is fixing it, make it 250 and 10 billion, or is fixing it, making it a billion. You know, is this just fundamentally something with a small town? You know, is looking at cool pictures on Instagram naturally something that has a massive town and arguing with strangers on the internet? I'm kind of answering my own question. You think that would be a huge town, but like the, I suppose the question is, yes, it's an awful, it's a fucked up kind of a company, but if it wasn't fucked up, would that make it a hundred billion dollar business? Probably, but well, hundred billion, hundred billion dollar market cap, maybe, but would it make that like a, you know, why is it a $5 billion revenue company? Could it be a $10 billion revenue company? You know, is it that the ad product is terrible or is it they fundamentally don't know what I'm interested in because that's not what I talk about? Yeah, that, it is an interesting thing that the good, I mean, clearly the impact is disconnected from the, uh, fr from the value that's been created, which is just like an interesting concept in general. And also the people that are influential and cover it are also very active on it. And so it's this self-fulfilling sort of thing. Mm. I guess one thing that you touched on that I think is interesting just to back up a little bit, and it segues to another thing I, I wanted to talk about with you, but was obviously Gabe Plotkin this week shut down uh, Melvin, which uh, was mm. left kind so of This reeling. is a very New York tweet. I'd literally never heard of him until you emailed me. It, it's so funny uh, that well, you so know the circles of circles of interest. Yeah, yeah, I know the story. Yeah, yeah. The, you know the he was one of the guys thing. that he got caught in the game slot short squeeze. Yeah, yeah. And so this goes back to I guess what's interesting here. I mean, there's a lot of finance related stuff that I think is interesting of like why he's doing this and you know where they yeah. are, right? But the zooming out to the part that I, I think it ties back to this Elon thing is what is the role of the retail investor, right, in mm. all of this stuff where you're getting caught in the crosshairs to some extent of Elon's machinations that are going on on a daily basis with Tesla stock and Twitter stock. And there mm. is this populist sentiment of pushing back on these billionaires, right, that obviously manifested mm. itself in GameStop. And so I'm curious, like, 
who from your equity research uh, lens on the Elon thing, like who is uh, who do you think gets hurt? Obviously, there's pension plans and all of that that are exposed to, you know, the 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 daily price swings that are going on because of their ownership mm. in Twitter. But like if you just view it from a fundamental standpoint, why? Why do these laws need to be in place? And why is Elon at odds with the SEC, uh, uh, you know, pushing back on all these things that are going hmm. on? So, um, so I have this sort of joke that um, Jeff Bezos has a safe behind his desk with an encyclopedia of retail from 1980 that he's working through page by page, kind of like Biff Tannen in Back to the Future 2. You know, it's like... Private label products. Can you imagine such a thing? Yeah. So this hilarious, there's this hilarious Twitter thing of people discovering that Apple has private label and these people have like never been in a store. Yeah. I yeah. have no idea that this has been part of retail for Shipping a century. Shipping away at um, problems that have been solved in different generations. Uh, yeah. It's like Amazon's a retailer, like good go figure. Um, and there's a sort of similar point here, like a lot of crypto is like, working its way through confessions of a stock operator. Yeah. The 1920s banking um, regulation. Yeah. It's like you can corner a market. The insider trade. And, and so, um, you know, we used to have a model in which basically nothing was illegal except actual fraud and fraud was pretty narrowly defined even then. Um, and in fact, you know, I believe technically insider trading isn't legal in the USA now. It's only illegal under certain situations, which is why Mark Cuban got off. Yeah. You know, so it's not you trade on non-material, non-public information, you go to jail. No, it has to be, well, why did you have it? And did they know? And why, like, there's a whole bunch of get-out clauses around that. Um, and so there's a, sort of, there's a sort of general point here, which is that um, if you have basically unsuffered, there's a whole bunch of laws around, like, let's go kind of, kind of a super macro view here. Um, we have laws around food safety because we decided that you should not ask everybody in the developed world to actually have to do their own due diligence on that bottle of milk when they buy it in the supermarket. They should not have to, and you know, I say you put the list of ingredients on the back. Okay. They shouldn't have to go and look up on Wikipedia what that chemical yeah. is on the back of the food to know if it's safe. There's a degree to which, you know, actually it's not reasonable just to leave it to the market. You know, you should actually, you know, the society in general should sort of intervene and say, no, there's certain things you're not allowed to do. You know, it's like we, we have a law that says you have to have fire escapes in the building. And nobody says, well, it's as a consumer, it's my choice whether I decide to take that risk and live in a building that has no fire escapes. Like, no, we just decided to set a baseline of, no, you have to have fire escapes in the building. You have to have fireproofing. You have to have sprinklers. Um, you have to have a seatbelt in the car. You have to have airbags. And so you have that, you know, there's a sort of ba very basic general principle that there are certain regulations around consumer protection, safety, and so on. Um, we have a police department. We just don't expect everybody to own their own gun. Well, obviously, sorry, I'm talking in America. Yeah, yeah, Maybe you yeah. do, but like in the UK, you, know, you don't. We do. Yeah, exactly. But there's like there's a very basic print agreement in principle that you have government rules around some stuff that you can have products can work. And if you can lose your house or die, then those rules get kind of serious. And so that applies to. I mean, a couple of years ago, I, I did a presentation on regulation, and a, there's a study that somebody did on like what are all the regulated industries. And it's not just finance. In fact, finance is sort of, and it was basically a scoring of how many rules are there. And it's like, there's industrial fishing and oil refineries and av aviation and so on. Because, um, how can I put it? And this is also like a tech regulation conversation. Like every company is subject to what you might call general legislation. Like if, if, you know, if, 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 um, you know, one venture capitalist shoots another one, you don't get arrested by the NBCA. You know, it's not a securities law issue. That's just murder. Um, but then, you know, everyone is subject to accounting law. Everyone's subject to health and safety law, the occupational safety law and so on. But then there's some law industries that are kind of specific enough and the problems are specific and important that you get kind of your own set of laws. So there's laws for cars and laws for oil refineries and laws for fishing and laws for food safety. And there's laws for finance. Because if shit goes wrong, you lose your house. And we made a kind of collective decision that when we decided we weren't going to have any rules, we got the Great Depression. And that kind of sucked. So maybe we want to make sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah. So that's what gets you all this cold consumer protection stuff. And I get that there are people only in America who are the idea that you shouldn't have any of these laws at all. And everyone should be sort of free to make their own decision as to what investing products they buy. 
And there's certainly areas where there's some lack of logic in like, why is it that anybody can buy a stock but can't buy this? Yeah. And there's certainly kind of places where you can poke away and say, well, I get the principle, but you're not applying it properly. And, you know, you know, securities laws experts can argue about like where there are weird stuff in American securities laws that doesn't make sense. Fine. But the principle that like, actually, no, you don't let people bet this, you know, you don't, you do what Jordan Belfort did was illegal. And we didn't rely on the people who lost their savings to go and do their due diligence on this product. That was illegal. You know, I didn't have a problem with that. Um, there's the challenge with cryptocurrencies, which is it's, um, with tokens, I should say, really not cryptocurrencies, which is it, it's, it's sort of a security and sort of not, and it's sort of investment and sort of not. And so it sort of breaks your assumptions around public market, private market, it's passing a certain threshold of risk that makes it okay. Um, and so it gets kind of challenging as to think, well, how do you reconcile your public policy objective, which you don't have a bunch of, that Jordan Belfort goes to jail, um, with the desire not to just make a crypto based web three based product, just kind of impossible. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of stop talking there, but like, uh, that, that's a, that's a kind of a, a challenge there in like, yes, you want the regulation in principle, but how do you align the policy objective of the regulation with this new thing? when it does seem to kind of conflict with some of the ideas that you have within it. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, Sam Bankman-Fried, the, the uh, CEO of FTX, wants crypto to be regu uh, regulated by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, mm. right, rather than the SEC, just because of the level of scrutiny that the SEC uh, would have on all of this stuff. And I think, I mean, you'd have to be pretty ignorant. And that's sort of what, uh, there is this populist sentiment in the US in general, and it's this libertarian mindset of like, mm. you shouldn't tell me what to do, right? And it manifests yeah. itself in the vaccine, and it manifests itself in uh, retail trading and crypto and all of that. And it's this sort of idealism that, hey, I should be able to- uh, I'm allowed to lose my own money. Yeah, I should be allowed to lose my own money, which, but even, or I should be allowed to do with my body what I want to do, right? And, mm. but we, we, we were able to agree on principles, back to your point, that like a seatbelt probably were saving people from themselves, right? Or, well, seatbelts well, seat are interesting because seatbelts argued, people argued about seatbelts for a long time, and there are still people who would say, well, it's my choice. Totally. Um, drink, drink driving is a bigger one because then it's other people. It's involving lives. other people. Which, 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 which side does the vaccine sit on, right, is a debate. Yeah. Is it seatbelts but, but or is I it think, drunk driving? Well, but, but, but pushing that further, I would say this is more like saying impact standards for cars. Yeah. Because it is only you, but it's a choice that's sort of not been taken away from you. You now can't buy a car that doesn't meet those standards or it's food safety standards. You know, you can't choose to buy food that contains that chemical. It's just not available, it's illegal to sell it. Or, you know, it's a, like a licensed doctor. Why do you have to go to a licensed doctor? Why did I? Why shouldn't I be allowed to just make my own judgment decision around that? Well, because let's talk about what would actually happen in that environment. You'd have huge numbers of fraudulent doctors and lots more people would die because people would make, you know, most people would, you know, people, people would be tricked and conned and there would be idiots and charlatans and lots of people would die and that wouldn't be actually be a good outcome collectively. So there was always this kind of, as you say, there's this tension between sort of libertarianism on the one hand and the fact that, well, actually, you know, there are, we do agree that there are some places where you have those protections, but you know, people argued about this a lot in the 19th century. People argued about food safety. I mean, why should there be laws? People should be free to choose. And so where do you think, uh, where do you think all this Elon, uh, stuff nets out now? I mean, obviously it'll be interesting to see that there's kind of the nuclear option for him, which is the SEC saying, Hey, you can't be on the board of a public company. Right. And that's like, I don't think that's a practical gun that they're going to fire. Right. I just don't. Well, the problem is it's back to my point about, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the, the funding secured thing, yeah. like what's, you know, they have this, the problem is the, the. The, the people who try to protect from harm with shelters and so, but if you, you know, if you can Elon, that's not good for shelters. Yeah. And so this is the kind of the thing he's, the, you know, the, the, te the thing he dances with is like, he's daring them to fight, he's daring them to do something. Cause if they do something that would actually be against, ultimately also be against their remit. I don't know. I mean, there's, in, there's a generalized Elon securities law, like what happens next and there's a horse thing and so on. 
Um, I think there's a more specific Twitter thing, which is, you know, there's a break clause and he'd have to pay a billion dollars or whatever it is or get sued for more versus, um, you know, he could get it for 20 billion less for the sake of argument. So, you know, that's how real estate developers work. You know, that's how, you know, you go and you retrade it. Um, and I, in a sense, I don't have a huge amount of sympathy for, you know, Twitter's board, like they're adults and they've run this thing for 10 years. And the person I have least sympathy for at all is, is Jack, who seems to have no awareness at all that he was actually the CEO of that company. I think he's forgotten. Long. Like, it's it's funny how he's he's both been Parag's biggest advocate and Elon's biggest advocate at the same time. And he's both the CEO that resided over the banning of Trump, but also thinks he should be back on the platform because, you know, that was a business decision or something. He he does have a unique ability to talk out of both sides of his mouth on this. Yeah, it's like the you know, when he finds out who was chief executive of Twitter, he's going to be really surprised. It's going to be, if, when he walks past you. the mirror, the next time he walks past the mirror, he's going to be very shocked to find out what's what's there. But I do think it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't think I crystallized that the thread through all of these things is, be it crypto, be it Elon, be it uh, Plotkin and GameStop, it, the thread through all of this, not to mention public market bloodbath that we're sort of living mm -hmm. through, is where regulation exists, like the, the tension, especially in the US, and I guess talking mm. to someone from the UK uh, is helpful in this, is what is the tension that exists between regulation and uh, liberty or, or whatever, like a freedom mm. of choice, right? And that- Yeah, what well, do you see this, what well, we haven't mentioned it is, is freedom of speech, which is also kind of a fascinating one, but this is particular thing that sort of drives me crazy is, is Americans who are under the impression that freedom of speech is invented in the American Constitution and defined by it. And the only way, the only answer to any question is, well, this is what the Constitution says, as though, like, as though there's no other kinds of speech and no other ways it can be constrained and no other countries who might have their own opinions about this. Yeah. Uh, that, that's why the, the, in, the, in a world in which like 95% of people on the internet are not in America. The literal interpretation of the Constitution is something that I, I'm sure this is blasphemous to say to 50 percent of America. But the literal interpretation of that as the standard by which international private companies should govern is just like a pretty it's it's a very myopic American worldview about like mm. how things are, are done in general. But it, it, it is a fascinating um, tension to see it playing out on the world stage with all of this stuff And I, I assume the end state of all this is going to be more regulation for crypto, more regulation mm. for uh, Elon, more regulation for, uh, you know, retail investors protecting themselves against uh, some of these things. But it's interesting to see people try to push for like margin trading uh, for retail investors, right? And it's like, gosh, I feel like we've seen this movie and it didn't end particularly well for the people involved. And so I, yeah. I, I just think this populist sentiment uh, is when it ultimately turns as the public market has, I don't think it ends well for the uh, for the people that have lots of money today and have done well surviving in the existing construct, right? So while we're talking, I'm just kind of Googling a kind of something that I'm curious about is what percentage of um, ownership in different countries, stock markets are retail investors? Because I would be willing to bet that it's much higher in the U.S. than most of the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's certainly markets where um, the proportion of the economy that's a public company is smaller than the U.S. Indeed. And so the, I mean, it's just sort of an observation, but, um, you know, the S&P 500 is down, whatever it is, year to date, down... Um, Twenty percent was my guess. Yeah, the 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 FTSE one hundred is down one point five percent. So some of this is a sort of a U.S. thing, and the retail thing, particularly the ideology you're talking about, is a, is a, is a U.S. thing. But the retail investing frenzy is sort of a U.S. thing, um, I think. I mean. I'm, don't have the data in front of me. I'm willing for somebody to tell me this yeah, as well. No, no, no. But I, it is kind of a US specific story, I think. Um, of course, some of that is that so many of the big tech companies that get all the memes behind them are American companies. But it's also just a sort of the generalized, you know, the idea that you everyone should own stocks is kind of a US, much more US thing than than in many other countries. Um, I mean, there's a sort of, there's a divergence here and there's sort of two different regulatory conversations. There's three different regulatory conversations because there's a sort of an Elon regulatory conversation. 
And then there's a sort of retail investing regulatory conversation where I'm afraid the answer is probably, look, if the market goes down by half and then goes sideways for three years, like, stop worrying about retail investors. Because yeah. <laughs> <'cause, laughs> um, the reason out. it's been, everyone has been rushing to the party because everything's fucking tripled in the last three years. Yeah. Um, that's why there's a retail investing story. Like, if that doesn't happen for the next three years, guess what? Everyone will go home. Um, there's a much more kind of generalized conversation, which is sort of regulation of technology more generally, where in fact it's actually most of the driver it comes from outside the usa um there's the us um it just caps another kind of another conversation um the the us tends to have a model of regulation by litigation and by crime did you break sherman antitrust act yes or no and this is what we saw in the apple epic lawsuit like did they break this law yes or no um whereas um the uk and europe have a model of a regulator that can write laws. So the regulator can say, do we think this market's anti-competitive? Do we dislike the market structure of this market? Is this bad for consumers? Yes. And therefore we will just change stuff. So, you know, the EU will, you know, the EU is passing a law at the moment called the, the, um, digital markets act, which will basically require everything from, um, you know, this is, this is an argument about how broad it is, but they will just require Apple to open up the app store. And that, it's not because Apple will go to court and lose a court case. They'll just pass some new, they'll just create a new set of regulations and say, no, 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 we're just going to change how that market works. Um, and so there's, whereas in the US, what you, what you have at the moment is this law that, that Ted Cruz and somebody has introduced yesterday, like we're going to ban any company from having more than $20 billion of advertising in the US, like something, I forget what the details are. You get these sort of press release laws that are really hard to, it's hard to understand how much attention you should pay to it because it's, most of them never happened. Whereas in Europe, there's a, this giant law that takes five years and then rather like GDPR, it just lands and they're like, oh shit, <laughs> it's real, it's here. Yeah. And we don't have any choice about it. Yeah. And we don't get to go to court and argue about it. It's there, like you're tough shit. You've got to, you've got to obey that law. Um, and we're kind of going through that process now, whatever the regulatory model is in the US, the UK, Europe, and so on, of kind of bringing great chunks of tech inside a sort of regulatory envelope in a way that it never was before. Um, and it's very different from what happened to Microsoft 25 years ago, which was just one company and just one thing. Um, this is a digital markets act, which applies to the Amazon marketplace and applies to Airbnb and applies to the app store and applies to digital advertising and applies to a whole bunch of stuff. And then there's a digital services act, which is a call, basically a law that says everyone has to do content moderation, yep. kind of the way Facebook is already doing it. And if you, you don't get to argue, like you, that's the law, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's an interesting, I mean, it, so I guess the net of all this is I think we're going to be facing litigation and regulation and, uh, and a bunch of stuff, uh, here in the coming, coming months. So I, uh, I, I guess we'll have to, uh, press pause there, but thanks, uh, Ben, thanks for making the time sure. to going through all this. This is fascinating. You, uh, sure. you clearly, yeah, yeah, this is clearly a, uh, an insightful topic or conversation that you have a lot of opinions about. So, uh, really appreciate you yeah, making it. I have, I have, I have opinions. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, good. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for doing this. Good to chat. Just want to interject here and, uh, thank everyone for listening. Um, and a call out to, if you are enjoying this, please do like subscribe, uh, leave a review, share with friends, all that stuff. Um, everything is super appreciated. So, uh, what you're going to hear next is a conversation between me and my friend, Alexis Gay. I'm sure a number of you follow her online, her tweets and her videos. We go into her background, how she got into uh, comedy, how she started a podcast, um, how we met, all that stuff. So excited for you to hear the conversation with me and Alexis. I am here today with my friend, Alexis Gay. Alexis, thanks for doing this. Of course. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. So maybe you'll give it a little bit of background on our relationship. So we met over the internet over <laughs> COVID. Yes. That's I, right. uh, I think you had gone viral mm. for a video. Okay. Which <laughs> in this context was humor related. That sounds worse than, uh, so there was a, so you, sh you were doing content for a while yes. and you had a big video that broke through. That's right. That was in April of 2020. Beginning of the pandemic. That's right. Really early on. And it got thousands and thousands of likes and views. Yeah, it was it was anomalous for me in that I'd been creating stuff for a while while working full time in tech. But this particular video got an order of magnitude more attention. So so it was about a uh, party uh, in San Francisco, like what people say. Oh, yeah. It was called Every Single Party in San Francisco. And at the beginning of the week before I posted that video, I had 950 followers on Twitter and the most views any video I'd gotten on Twitter was about a thousand. And 
by the end of that week, when I posted that video, I had 15,000 Twitter followers and it had 3.1 million views. Jeez. So when I say an order of magnitude, yeah, totally. no, I very mean... <laughs> literally, that, that is actually what an order of magnitude yes. means. And so, so that went viral. So maybe, maybe your work career at mm-hmm. that point, you were working at Patreon. That's right. And so you had had a maybe t- take through your your tech career a little bit there, and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean it's a tale as old as time. Tech to comedy, obviously. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. A very <laughs> natural. Well trodden path. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aspiring. It's yeah, not going I see, as you're well. On your yours, way. yours is going better than mine is. Yeah. <laughs> So I I was working in tech right out of college, and I worked at a small startup here in New York. I wanted to go further into tech, so I moved out to San Francisco. I worked at Twilio, API company for yeah, cloud communications. We were investors. Happy, oh, happy former <laughs> investors. Yes, it worked out well for us. Same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then after Twilio, I worked at a company called Patreon for three years. Yep. And Patreon was, um, when I joined, Patreon had about 120 people. And I was so lucky. I feel like I joined at exactly the right time. Because what year is this? This was 2016. Okay. Oh, sorry. I joined Patreon in 2018, March okay. of 2018. So tw- Twilio was 2016 That's to right. 18. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Patreon was an opportunity for me to come in and do stuff I really loved. So I was joined to do strategic biz dev and build out operations on the partnerships yep. team. And then by the time I left three years later... I was running the partnerships team and had gotten to build out biz ops on the go to market side. And so I went from being an IC originally hired to help people that had big, big audiences understand how they could use Patreon to running that team and having seven direct reports, which was such an unbelievable, like everything I could ever want from my tech career for the perfect company. Totally. Yeah, exactly. It was a nice, I guess you probably learned a lot interacting with all those people 100%. for what you're doing today, which we'll talk a little Absolutely. bit more about. But so on the relationship side, so that video went viral. Yes. And then it was that weird period in COVID where like people were all like interacting online yeah. only because <laughs> we were actually like very nervous about COVID at yes, that point in time. Absolutely. And like Clubhouse was a big thing. Clubhouse was I remember huge we were in a Clubhouse room together at yes. one point. And I was a, uh, that, in earnest, I didn't really start posting on Twitter until the beginning of the pandemic. Was when Really? I, yeah. My former employer was uh, in RIA. Um, oh, yeah. okay. And so uh, the amount of stuff I could post mm-hmm. and like how unencumbered I could be with what yeah. I would say. You didn't want to get called into the principal's uh, office. I, 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 well, I, I did get called into the <laughs> principal's <laughs> office at times. And so then I joined Redpoint yeah. and we're not registered with the same like considerations. Sure. And also it was the pandemic when we were uh, I was bored, yeah, and I get that. Uh, and so I started tweeting in earnest, and uh, yeah, and so so we uh, got to be friends through that, right? Yeah. And then we finally met uh, in real life sometime Some, that fall, maybe. Maybe Miami? No. No, yeah. no, 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 yeah, really, no, yes. no, no. We met in New York before then. I don't think so. Yeah. No. That, when that that bar that like is high up in the <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't know what it is. It was like Why a good did town. I repress that memory? Yeah, yeah. I don't that know. Was, oh my god, that's you're right. Yeah, you overlooking totally Central did. Park. So yeah. we met there and then and then hung out. Well, uh, you know what I recently found? I think your first tweet to me. Do oh, you is know that right? That you tweeted to me no, before I, we met. No, that sounds uh, it sounds ominous. Hopefully, know, it was a very sound. normal. Uh, you know, what? I waited to tell you that yeah, until uh, I started great. recording. We'll need to pull this up and have this on screen yeah, as no, we're it's talking. Not, it's nothing bad. I think you just said like you're very funny oh, or something good. like that that's and nice. i was like oh that's wow. a positive energy bringing to twitter i was I, really surprised but i thought you were funny too so good. i'm surprised to learn you just started um yeah i did a little bit i i don't know I, I could probably go back and yeah i dabbled i uh i could probably go back and look but i, I think i probably had a i don't know a thousand or two thousand followers yeah. or something at the time and i was doing like very serious like software valuation posts which when did you start your twitter account uh, 2010. Okay. But, but it was, you know, whatever. Yeah. I, I remember I was sitting in my college, uh, it was my senior year of college and I was sitting there and enough people were talking about it that I was like, I, I need to figure out what this 100%. thing is. Right. I mean, uh, but, I but I probably high school. Oh, is that right? Literally in the computer lab of our library in high school. Wow. Me and a couple of my friends. We're like, Hey, let's get this. Twitter. <laughs> let's get on Twitter. Have you, has your handle stayed the same? No, I changed it. Yeah. My first handle was, okay, this is going to date the moment when I got Twitter. Was it like Lax DMB or something? Because that, <laughs> that was like my AOL thing. Yeah, I was yeah, going to say, yeah, that sounds yeah. like yours. No, at the time that that song that was like A Bay Bay, A yeah, Bay yeah. Bay, was yeah, popular yeah. and my last name is Gay. So my first Twitter handle was A Gay Gay. Oh, that's good. Mm-hmm. That's clever. Yeah. 
Yeah. It probably doesn't, uh, hasn't aged as well for like professionalism. And yeah, yeah you probably had to evolve a little bit. I've, that. Yes, I've evolved. Yeah. Um, so, so you did Patreon and That's you right. left when? I left in December of 2020. December of 2020. Okay. So yeah. in the middle of the pandemic. And, and so you had that breakthrough in April of 2020. You had mm-hmm. been making videos and stuff before then. Yeah, like, totally. So was that kind of a side hustle thing that you were doing and then it broke through and then yeah. it continued? To, I assume the videos after that did well if you go from yeah. whatever, 950 followers. So, okay. Also, I love how hobbies got rebranded as a side hustle. There was a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When hustle people, culture. Right. Well, there yeah. was a time when people did things because they enjoyed it. Well, I guess that's an interesting <laughs> question of how much of it was a uh, hobby that right. you were just entertaining yourself yes. with which versus, hey, I think that this can be something yeah. at some point, right? Because like I think of uh, side hustle as maybe an ambition that is mm-hmm. going to ultimately, maybe if it works out, translate to something right. versus hobby, you're just spending your time. Well, that's why I point out the distinction yeah. because this was never my intention to do this professionally, to leave my job, to leave tech and pursue comedy of all things or podcasting of all things. I genuinely just in 2017, while I was working at Twilio, I had moved from New York to San Francisco, New York, which has different career paths and different types of people yes. and different things. And I moved to San Francisco, which has one thing, and it is tech. Yep. And I worked at a tech company and all my friends worked in tech. The person I was dating worked in tech. Everything I did all the time was tech. And I make it, a joke, by the way, uh, of like New York famous people walk into a bar and it's like Derek Jeter yeah. or like Lauren Michaels yeah. or whatever, yeah. right? Michael Bloomberg. And in uh, San Francisco, like famous person walks into the bar and it's like Reed Hoffman. Or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like nothing against Reed. He seems like yeah, a great guy. No, yeah, but, like, but it's so funny. He's not like a celebrity. It's so true. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that, um, you know, that sort of like one note vibe was something that started to feel kind of overwhelming, yeah. especially because I had come from New York, which had felt so rich culturally. And so going to San Francisco, I decided that a way to shake up my, my life would be to take improv classes. Mm. It was like this escape. I thought, OK, well, after work, I'll just do this because I'd grown up acting. And that yep. was always something I'd really loved. And so improv was a way to kind of like act as a hobby. It had never occurred to me that that choice would then become like doing comedy full time. Yeah. But improv classes is what led to making YouTube videos, which is what led to doing stand up, which is what led to all of the comedy stuff uh, culminating into what I do now. Did you ever think about doing uh, like acting professionally? Oh, yeah. Oh, this is a fun fact. My my plan was to be an actress growing up. Interesting. That was always the plan. But. There's a flaw in the plan, which was that I was always intensely academic as well. Yeah. So I was never just like, I'm a theater kid and that's all I want to be. I was always like, yeah, I'm going to be an actress. I'm also going to like work really hard to get good grades because I need that gold star. Yeah. But I was like, but ultimately it won't really matter because I'll be an actress. And then I went to I went to NYU where I got to design my own major and I made sure to take lots of classes that were in the arts, acting, et cetera. But I paired it with a business minor called The Business of Entertainment, Media, and Tech. Was that something they actually offered or did yeah. you? Okay. Mm-hmm. And so that was a way for me to feel like I'm going to get a great education, a liberal arts education, humanities, but have a nice business minor to round it out. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because I'm going to be an actress. But then when I graduated and it was like, hey, guess what? It's time to act. I was like, cool. I'm going to get a job at a tech startup. Totally. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, the like the people I always historically, a lot of the people that pursued like creative endeavors mm. or either uh, this is something I've I thought about. I'm not sure if yeah. this actually proves out, but like, you know, Anderson Cooper uh, came from the Vanderbilts. Right. Or Nick Kroll's mm-hmm. family are billionaires. Julie Lewis Dreyfus mm-hmm. family billionaires. Like you go through Rashida Jones, Quincy mm-hmm. Jones. You sort of go through uh, Kate Hudson, Goldie Hawn. Yeah. It's kind of like. People that grew up with a lot of money and were kind of exposed, willing to take that risk Mm. or people that had nothing to lose. Right. And so like Brad Pitt came from, you know, whatever, a small Midwestern town. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like in the middle where uh, there's not really a soft landing if you go for acting and fame. It's not like, oh, the gradient of curve of like what you make or your professional success Mm -hmm. is like pretty harsh. Right. It's either you make it and you're amazingly successful. Yeah. Or then there's like a bunch of small stuff in the mm-hmm. middle, but you're still kind of living paycheck to paycheck yeah. or you're like totally struggling. Right. Yes. And it's hard, I'm sure, when you're faced with the option of like, 
having a comfortable tech job yeah. versus going to move to LA right. or whatever. It's probably pretty daunting. There's so much there to to talk about. So one thing is that this was in 2013 when I was facing this decision. And at the time, you know, making stuff on the internet wasn't a career. Yeah. And it was barely a thing. It was some people, you know, had been on YouTube really early on. But if you were interested in the arts, like in acting or whatever, music, I don't think that at that time you immediately looked at the internet as a way to develop independent success and fame. Yep. Um, and so that wasn't even in my brain, the idea that that could be a path for me. And acting felt so powerless because you would always, I felt like I would always be waiting for somebody to say, oh, it's your turn. Waiting for somebody to pick me, to, to cast me, to bring me on as a client. And it's outside of your control. And also it's not like a linear career path 100%. where you can always be talking yourself into, I'm just my big break away. Oh, right. Yeah. And you're, it's like, oh, you hear about John Hamm or George Clooney or mm -hmm. like people that got to be successful at 35, 40. But how many people delude themselves into thinking that mm. like, oh, well, if this works out, yeah. right. But it's totally outside of your control versus totally most jobs are like control. at least somewhat linear that you're putting mm -hmm. one foot in front of the other and you know, like, OK, I'm going to be a manager, then yeah. a senior manager, then maybe a VP mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Right. And also you can work really hard and not have that correlate with your success. Yes. And so let's contrast that with tech. Working at a 17-person tech startup in 2013? Come on. Yeah. All I had to do was show up on time, be nice, and say yes to everything. And yeah. that was my career strategy for three years. Totally. And it worked great. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and it's a much more normal distribution of like, you know, it, 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 at the very top of acting, it's it's amazingly successful, 100%. right? You go down like 5% and you're like scraping to get by, yeah. right? Versus tech, if you're the very top, you're doing super well, but 5% yeah. down is... And so, so the creative uh, element of it, so you were doing... Uh, you were surrounded by all tech people oh, in yeah. San Francisco mm -hmm. and you started to think about like, uh, I need some outlet. Yeah. And so you started doing improv yeah. as a, now was comedy uh, when you were acting, was that like a thread that you thought about going down? Never. There was one moment when I thought about comedy as a way to, to act. And it was after I read Tina Fey's book, Bossy Pants. Hmm. And I was just like, I think it was 2010. I think I was a sophomore in college. And I was like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do what she did. And then I just, didn't. What was her career path? I actually don't know. She came up through Second City. She did. Through okay. doing improv. Yeah. The SNL um, and writing comedy. and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And then SNL and then 30 Rock. Um, and now she obviously writes and produces a lot and stuff totally. like that. But I that was the only time when it ever like occurred to me that that was a thing somebody could do. Something about reading her book. And I love she's such a role model. Yeah, 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 she's amazing. But that was 2010, and I didn't end up doing it till 2020. So it took 10 years for that to actually come true. Well, and even then, like, Second City's the one, right? You know, it's mm -hmm. like, that's the, yeah. you know, and SNL is the one, exactly. right? And it's not exactly. like there's another, you know, there's there's Twilio, and there's mm -hmm. Stripe, and there's Page. <laughs> you know, there's a bunch of, like, successful yes, companies. Exactly. It's not like there's one that, yes, like, is the stamp exactly. on the resume to, yeah. to make it. And so so you're doing improv classes. Yep. It, you're enjoying it, presumably. Obsessed. I remember the moment, the first time our team got a laugh. When you take improv classes, often there's like a grad show at the end, which is it's like making your adult friends come to a dance recital, but whatever. My exposure to improv, <laughs> like like Barry, basically. I, yeah, yeah, that's like that's where I get most of my information about improv and acting classes. But yes, I get it. I yeah. get it. Um, you should have you ever done improv? No, never. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, did, I maybe in high school. I I uh, maybe my freshman year of high school, I took a drama class and I had to do really? like improv. Oh yeah. yeah. What was that enjoyable? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Oh I mean, I, not, not so much that I never took another class okay, again, but, I get that. uh, but yeah, I guess. All right. I would come just, you know, I would come to your improv show. You would. If you ever, yes. If you ever text me and you were like, Hey Alexis, <laughs> I have an improv show. I don't, know I, would that's come. A I don't know if that's a text you're getting, but I would come to that. I yeah. just want you to know if you need just one person to support one, you, yeah. I'll be in the front one row. One fan. <laughs> one yeah, fan. Good. All it takes is one true, one true fan. <laughs> one actually, true fan. we thought it was 10,000. <laughs> then it was a hundred. It's actually one true fan. Only fan. If it's me. Only yes. fan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but anyway, so the thing uh, about improv, you have these grad shows and I literally remember the first laugh we got and it was like a lightning bolt through my body. Like, I remember just getting off stage and just being like, wow, I want to feel that one million times. And you're at Twilio now. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing this yeah. and you're like, that's amazing. I, I want to keep doing this. And totally. So, and but so what did they, so you started doing YouTube? Like, was, were there people you'd look to at that point? I don't even remember what the mm -hmm. YouTube like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, were there people that you could look at and be like, all right, I want to internalize like that mm. video style a little bit? Because mm. you have a 
signature video mm. style, at oh, least the way that you. I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> the Alexis Gay branded Ooh. video. Uh, TM. Were there people that you sort of looked at and it's like, okay, I'm going to port over like this version mm. and make it tech or San Francisco centric? Uh, I would love to say yes. It would make it sound like there was a plan. But uh, no, I will also clarify that even though I loved improv immediately, um, I, th- I still there was no part of me that wanted to do it full time. Totally. Zero percent. I just loved how it felt. Yeah. And I also loved working in tech and yeah. I still love tech as an industry. Obviously, it's flawed in many ways. But I, th- I just have a lot of appreciation for it. And so comedy and sort of developing like what kind of comedy I wanted to do came out of like true love and joy from creating it. And so I didn't set out to build a following and I didn't set out to leave my job. I just like wanted more. So it was more like, okay, improv classes that led, you know, five rounds of improv classes led to co-founding. And it also, I love how I've can we curse on this? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to say, I love how I fucking say founding an improv team. I know, I know. I, oh, you found an improv team. Yeah. Oh, God. Yes. I was a co-founder, um, co-founder and COO uh, of our improv team. And that co-founder led to... Co-founder and COO. I'm joking. Oh, okay. I was going to say, <laughs> were there executive levels at this uh, yeah, improv team? I just brought the vibe of a COO that's to good. our improv yeah, team. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's probably a true fact. Yeah. You could interview some of yes. my teammates COO, and they see COO like, vibes. the spreadsheets are a little much, Alexis. Yeah. Um, but I actually did have spreadsheets because we'd put on shows in San Francisco and we would ticket them. And then that sort of led to YouTube videos because when I started working at Patreon, I had less time to do improv and perform live. And so I thought that YouTube would be a way for me to do it on my time and my terms. And in terms of an influence, my early YouTube videos are vlog style videos that have humor, but they are not what I now make. And that style is basically just my friend Jarvis Johnson style. Um, but my version. And that's because he was a new friend of mine at the time. And he also he referred me to Patreon and he was really into YouTube. And so he taught me like just through watching him and his style. That's how I developed like my first style, which, by the way, is very common, I think, in comedy is to say, OK, I like this person and what they do. I'm going to do my version of that. And it feels like you do that enough times and you find your own style. Totally. No, I, I agree 100 percent with that. Wait, uh, what is vlog style? Like, what was it? So it was like holding my DSLR camera on like a tripod, like talking direct to camera. But what I would do is I would script out my video and then I would tell a story to camera and go back and edit it with the quick cuts that are probably more closely associated with me now. But I would put in like production elements, like little sounds, or I'd have a lot of little visuals. And it would be telling a specific story. They were usually like four to seven minutes long. So one was like the worst part about moving in with my boyfriend. And it was how he left his bike in the hallway of our studio apartment, (laughs) which is truly one of the worst things that's ever happened to me. Um, And it was just about like telling that story or the story of what it's been like for my last name to be gay for my whole life. You know, like those little things that are specific to my experience, but told in like this direct to camera format with lots of cuts and production. What, uh, by the way, I, I, I'm glad you overcame that bike in the, uh, Thank in the you. hallway it thing. Was, that that was like, my struggle. Yeah, in your memoir, that's mm-hmm. going to be a, a really overcoming obstacle. three chapter. to five chapters. So, uh, okay, so so you're now doing these videos. You have one go super viral, mm-hmm. uh, and you're like, hey, did it, what, did it fulfill the same thing that you got from mm. improv? I assume different, right? Because you're not getting the immediate feedback in different, the same way. Different, but similar, honestly. That's a great question. You know, and I will add that in this moment in time, so it was April 2020, and I was I w- had been making these short little videos for a few weeks at that point, um, though I had, at different points in my life, I had done them different, you know, well, this wasn't like the first time I ever made a short video. Wait, this was which which number short video you published to Twitter? Um, um, I think like maybe f- four. OK, so fairly early, fairly early. Yeah. But in between working at Twilio and Patreon, I took time off. And the th- way that I filled that time was I decided I would make a short video every day for 30 days <laughs> um, because I'd never done it before. I've made videos when I was little with my friends, yeah, but yeah. I hadn't done it as an adult. And I knew I loved the feeling of video editing. And that was a way while I was unemployed for me to not just like plow through a season of Netflix. Totally. And making those videos one a day for 30 days taught me something very important. One, it helped me ramp up my skills way faster than if I had taken my time. And two, at that time, before I joined Patreon, it taught me, oh, I do not want to do this full time. 
my biggest takeaway from making those videos and really working hard every day at it was I extremely do not want this to be my job. Oh, interesting. And that's what led me to Patreon. And so why was that the case? Why was it that you didn't want to do it? Because at the time, I didn't see a path to doing it independently. Hmm. I didn't see a path to monetization and just creating short video content. And I missed tech. I missed doing biz dev. I missed having coworkers. And what I realized was, it would be uh, it would be shitty to do it full time. And also I would have someone if I worked for a company and I made content for them, I feared that I would have someone telling me how to do it, <laughs> which sounds really obnoxious that I'm like, I don't want feedback. Yeah, I I don't. It was a thing I did for joy. I don't want to know what someone else thinks of it. Totally. I just want to do it for fun. Yeah. Interesting. So 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 now you you this goes viral yeah. and you're like, OK, I need to capitalize on that moment and put more content out there. Or what was the reaction? Okay, so a lot of feelings because, like I said, I'd been making stuff online for several years, but not for an audience of that size. Yep. And then suddenly my audience was not only so much larger, literally 1,000 to 15,000, as I said, but it was also full of people I respect. Hmm. It was tech CEOs, people whose names I knew, investors I was familiar with, Logan Bartlett. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I think I, I, yeah, I was waiting for you to, uh, if you weren't going to work me on, I was. Huge people who I knew and who, or I should say who I knew of. Yeah, yeah, totally. And suddenly they're following me. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I mean, sure. But it was like I had been doing stand up for an intimate group of people and I'm holding the mic and then 15,000 people walk in yeah. and I had to keep telling jokes. Totally. Yeah, and it yeah. was such a bizarre feeling. Well, and and they're there because of a momentary video and now mm -hmm. you need to recreate that. Yeah. You're like, so was there, was there like, were you paralyzed to make the next one or did you just rip the bandaid and you're like, I got to, I got to just keep at it. If, if, if I might as well yeah. keep shooting because yeah. if they don't like me at 100%. this next shitty video yeah. that I'm going to put out there, like they're not, you know, they, they don't get the good ones that are yeah, going to come exactly. to. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't like me in my video of trying on jeans, then you don't deserve yeah, to be at exactly. my every single party in San Francisco. That's a real video I made. Um, uh, Okay, so the thing is, one, yes, I immediately was like, I have to rip the Band-Aid off. And so I forced myself on that day that it went viral to write and publish, I think, two or three jokes. Because mm. I was like, the longer I go without saying anything, the more pressure I'm personally totally. going to feel. Yeah, you're building up the... Yeah, and also if they're going to leave, they'll leave. And I, I think that's okay. And I want to come back to that point, actually, because it's something I learned at Patreon that I think is really valuable. But on top of that, you know, I there was a moment where it was like, oh, the first video that's ever, quote, done well was about tech and about San Francisco. And I even had a friend kind of say to me, like, oh, my God, what are you going to do next? You should just make part two. You should make every single party in San Francisco part two. And I consciously chose not to do that. And instead, I put out a video that had nothing to do with tech intentionally. Because I was afraid that if I started going down a path of only creating one type of content, it would be so hard to break out of that later. Yeah. So people follow you for for one reason. It's like you got to be careful the followers you get, right? right? It's like if you do one thing and they're going to keep coming back to mm -hmm. hear the hits, exactly. right? And you're not going to get an opportunity to have your Bob Dylan electric album or whatever <laughs> it is. I don't know the right analogy, but yeah. <laughs> but you're, you're, if they want you acoustic, then exactly. they're going to ask you for to play the San Francisco tech video. And that was a fear of mine yeah. because tech has been a big, big part of my life. Ironically, a big part of my comedy life as well. Yeah. But it's not the only thing about me. And so the next video I put out was um, my reaction to watching season three of Westworld, hmm. which was a very confusing show to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so that's I think a lot of people. thing to a lot of people. Yeah. And, uh, and so that was, that was an intentional choice. The thing that I really committed to was I'm going to put this out every week. And even then, it was not because I want to do it professionally. It was because I was living in a studio apartment alone in San Francisco during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And I was sad. And yeah. I was like, this is a thing I can do that brings people joy, including myself. I'm going to do it every week while working full time. Yeah. It is amazing uh, the the consistency forcing yourself to to mm -hmm. just keep doing yeah. something like even ha setting deadlines even if artificial oh, for yeah. yourself. Hey, I'm going to push this out every yeah. like that's one of the things we've done is just hey midnight on Friday mm -hmm. Eastern time this is going out or you know it, it, with whatever however done it is or not we're going to get it out there and I don't know. People build habits around it, yep. right? It keeps discipline for yourself mm -hmm. to, you know, force and to some extent, I think constraints can breed creativity, I right? I love having creative constraints. Yeah. That's, you know, my videos are one minute because I, all of them are one minute. They're, mm. they're 59 seconds max. Mm. 
initially that was because Instagram used to only allow you to upload one minute. The first video I ever tried to make was two minutes long. And then Instagram was like, nope. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I just recut it to be a minute. Hmm. And that was in, I don't know, 2017 or 2018 or something. And I've just done it ever since because I love having that constraint. Yeah. I mean, you do a good job even of the jokes you make. I I, I feel like you, you're never snarky or like punching down or like you're sort of uh, building around like a positive sort of optimistic, which I think is even a yeah. harder type of humor mm. to do, right? Easy yeah. for me to be like a sarcastic asshole, right? <laughs> but, uh, but like, I, I think that is, you know, I, I've always respected Seinfeld and Larry David mm-hmm. and, you know, people that can just be clean and yeah. funny, right? Versus raunchy and you know, all that. And so I feel like you've, you've been able to, I don't know, not punch down in the jokes you make. Thanks. I'm so glad that you feel that way because it's very important to me. I, I hate being mean yeah. and I hate making people feel bad and I want to make people feel good. So I don't want to make fun of them. Yeah. Even when I am make, making fun of people, like people in tech, people in San Francisco, I'm always just making fun of myself. I, I This is kind of a joke, but not really, that most of my videos are just me taking a part of myself and just turning it up to 11. Yeah. Like, what if I was worse? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's interesting. It's one of the things I, I, my, I have a few like rules or lines that I won't really touch. And one of them is like not really making fun of founders, for example. Like my that job is only beholden on founders. And there's, you know, oftentimes very ridiculous things that founders will yeah. do. And I try not to specifically call out, you yeah, know, that, that makes sense. behavior. Now, if it's Elon or Mark Zuckerberg or whatever, I sort of mm-hmm. feel like that's within realm of like, mm-hmm. you know, that's fair. But for the yeah. most part, staying away from from specific founder examples, just because I, I don't totally know, our, my job's totally beholden on them continuing to do what they're doing. And a lot of people are going to fail and a lot of people aren't going to be able to be successful in what they're doing. But yeah. I am more willing to toe the the snarky asshole line, yeah. I think, than you are. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want someone to read something I write and be like, "Oh no, that oh, hurts. Yeah, <laughs> like that yeah. hurts." <laughs> yeah, I, I've made my bed with that one. Um, so, so in terms of, uh, in, so, so now you're pumping out these videos. It's going yep. well. You're sure. at Patreon, which I assume is empowering for all this stuff. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, this is the point that I wanted to that I wanted. There were two points here that I want to come back to. Yeah. One is around. Building for your audience. Oh my God, did I say building? I literally meant creating. Yeah. That's so embarrassing. Time to build. <laughs> you're you're totally build, been indoctrinated. I'm building in public. Yeah, building in public. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. Mark Andreessen's just just warped your brain. Yeah. <laughs> um. Wow. That was truly tragic for everybody involved. Um. Okay. So I think there's like creating for the audience, creating for your audience, then creating for an audience. And the difference here is something I used to talk about a lot at Patreon. So you kind of said earlier, like oh, I'm sure working at Patreon, you were exposed to a lot of things that maybe helped you later on. Yeah. This is absolutely true. One of the strongest things that I learned at Patreon was simply that this path was possible Mm. because I saw creators do it. What I learned is that it was unbelievably hard, but not impossible. There's no one roadmap to do... There's no one roadmap to become an independent content creator. Yeah, yeah. But all I needed was to know that people could do it. I was like, oh, it's just really hard. But you can do it. Great. Yeah. Okay. So that was a big takeaway. And then two, because my job was running the creator partnerships team, I would often speak at conferences about building membership and building an audience um, as a creator. And so I would present on what you can do to build your audience. And I was always careful to differentiate between building an audience, which you can do pretty quickly and you can do with growth hacks yep. and you can do by capitalizing on trends, but you may grow so fast that you attracted people who are not going to be along for the ride when you want to make something different. What if you want to make something different? Totally. That's one of the things I found is if I, if I, uh, because so many people have come along for jokes or making fun of the venture industry, yeah. if, if I do some thoughtful analysis or something, <laughs> I've started to do it enough that people like have stopped doing yeah. this. But for a long time, my entire feed was like, you know, make me a bicycle clown. It was yeah. like, <laughs> it was like, hey, can you yeah. do the jokes? I didn't come here for your like weighing in yeah. on the market machinations. I, I like your, I like when you're earnest. Yeah, I mean. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I uh, yeah. Well, it's good. I, I, I think I've started to get people used to. Hey, I'm not 
only a gest- jester, yeah. I can I can also. But yeah. that would be a pretty tough. I don't think I would get to. Uh, I think my partnership would be pretty annoyed with me if I was no, just like cracking like, jokes, you're walking like good into at meetings. Your job. I yeah. know it's kind of funny. I uh, I try to keep that hidden. I don't I don't no, tell a, a lot of people. I don't no. tell a lot of people that That's I. Uh, Nobody's listening. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that, that may be the case. We'll see. Uh, I'll report back on that. But yeah, uh, please let me know. So, so you're having uh, so you're having success. Yes. And when did it start to enter your mind? Hey, I might be able to do this actually. Ooh, well, when did, when did you start thinking about that sweet, sweet drug that are podcasts? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> the nectar that is the podcasting life. You know, I had wanted to start a podcast for a long time. Did you actually? I really did. Yeah, honestly. I didn't. You did. I know you didn't. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start a podcast because I was doing and still do scripted content. The videos yep. I write are are scripted. I write a script and then I shoot them and then I edit them. And it's also my face. It's so much of my face. Yeah. And editing takes a long time. It's a lot of looking at my own face, yeah. saying words that I wrote. And so that is kind of exhausting in a specific way. And a podcast was so attractive because I was like, I wouldn't have to look at my face mm. when I edited it. And then also it's improvised, depending on the type of podcast sure. you do. Yeah, yeah. And so when I, once I, it started occurring to me, and this was probably, let's say, mm-mm-mm. I'm going to say like, Late fall 2020, I wanted to start a podcast. So before I left, but I was like, it would be so great to have a way to put something out regularly that didn't rely on scripted and me being like the actor in it or whatever. And I knew that I wanted something repeatable because I knew I would want it to come out weekly because as we just discussed, like putting stuff out regularly is important for growth. Getting your audience prepared and used to what you're going to deliver and then delivering on it is really key for engagement. And I knew that I didn't want to script it or do something heavily produced or narrative. So I settled on, okay, I know I want to interview someone every week. And then I went through like a thousand concepts of what this podcast could be. And I backed into the show that I have today, which is non-technical, where I interview people from tech and business, but about everything except their resume. That took so long. I have docs that I've I've shared with you that are like all my different ideas, all my different name ideas, the cover art I designed and how I picked it and all that stuff. But I started thinking about it so much longer before I actually started it because I knew I needed the time to make it good. And I didn't think I could do that without leaving my job. Oh, interesting. And so what gave you the the confidence to leap in that? Was there someone that you looked at that said, hey, this person has been able to make it. And mm. so I think that I can do it. Like, I mean, does it just take no salary to go from having a salary oh, yeah. to no salary is a uh, is a big jump, right? That part sucked. Like buying stuff is dope. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, having things. Having things. Yeah. I'm a fan, yeah. frankly. Meals. Hot take. Yeah. Health insurance. Yeah, health insurance. I, That's stand. a big one. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, yeah. Pro health insurance. <laughs> I know. Hot take. Alexis Gay famously pro yeah, health yeah, insurance. Yeah, famously pro health. Um, okay, so how did I decide? Well, there's a couple things here. One, macro context. Um, it was the pandemic and it was December 2020. Like I said, when I officially left, I made the decision in October 2020. So we've been. And at- you've had a few podcast episodes out at that point no, or no? no. Oh, okay. I didn't start the podcast until I had already resigned from Patreon. Actually, like I think my first episode came out. My first episode came out December 9th. My last day of Patreon was like the 31st okay. of, of the year. So I launched it already as like my exit Transition thing. Out, yeah. Okay. But. You know, honestly, one of the big reasons that I felt empowered to leave was the world felt so unpredictable. I was like, I have no idea what's coming next. Just truly no concept of obviously no one saw the pandemic coming. I certainly didn't see it lasting as long as it did. And I just kept feeling like I don't know. And and I certainly didn't see that video going viral coming. Yeah. And all these things, good and bad, were just happening. And I thought, well... I would like to know what it feels like to have all of my time spent, uh, all of my time self-directed towards what I want to be doing. And the thing that really pushed me over the edge was redefining success. Because a lot of people, when I said, I'm going to leave and do this, they were like, oh, are you going to try to make it? You're going to try to make it as a comedian or as whatever? And I was like, not really, because I don't believe in that. Mm. What happens when you make it? What do you, what do you get up and do the next day? Totally. You're just done? Like, I will never be satisfied by that. But I wanted to know what it would feel like. The thing that I compare it to is going on a hike. No one is like, hey, was that a successful hike? You're like, how was it? Was it hard? What did you see? How was the weather? And so once I changed my perspective from I need to leave and crush it. Get to the top versus the journey that you enjoy along the way. I just wanted to know what this would feel like. Mm. And I'm so grateful. That was a year and a half ago. 
I love it. I still love it. I want to keep doing it. But if a year from now you and I are having dinner because I'm like, Logan, I'm ready to go back to tech, fire up, <laughs> yeah. fire up the port codes. Who yeah, wants yeah, me? yeah, exactly. Like, that would be a great outcome. How cool would that be? Yeah, if totally. I go back. I've learned so much. Well, and, and it's yeah, it, it's a two way door, right? That's yes. a, like that. Jeff Bezos often talks about like decisions that can be undone versus mm, the ones that can't be undone. Yeah. And like this is you can enjoy the journey along yeah. the way and then go back like I, there will be even more people that want to hire mm. you mm-hmm. than before, right? Mm. Because now you have this experience and you have a yeah. breadth of resume and you could go do mm-hmm. the community job at Patreon that you once did or incorporate all these things that you've learned along the way to yeah. help companies out. Yeah. No, that's super interesting. And so so the what are all the things you're doing today? What do I do today? So today I continue to uh, put short videos out on the internet. I yep. write a bunch of tweets. Which is, is that, that's not your, that's not a business. That's like a awareness thing for you. Like that, oh. are some of them sponsored? Every once in a while, I take on a very limited number of sponsored videos. And I, I'm very selective about when and how and who I do that with. Because literally like, I am so humbled by the opportunity to have an audience. Yeah. And I respect my audience so much that I never want anyone to feel like it's a cash pinata mm. where, oh, I'm just going to use them to make a bunch of money. Now, my podcast is unapologetically sponsored. Yeah. And I'm certainly not sitting here apologizing for the sponsored opportunities that I do take on because I, I too, need health insurance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> As we mentioned, we're yes, pro. pro. So, yeah. um, but... I think there's a way to take on sponsorship and there's a way to monetize your content that it makes sure that your audience still gets to feel respected and that you're still putting out stuff that brings a lot of joy. And so that's how I make all my decisions, all my decisions around how I take money. Yeah. It's interesting. You you made the point about you need to be comfortable with losing people along the way earlier and said you wanted to come back to that. Was that part Mm. of this that like if people are going to get upset about you're like, hey, I'm doing this for the most part, it's free content for everyone, right? Yeah. Is anything behind a paywall that you do? No. So it's kind of like, hey, if you don't like it, <laughs> you can yeah, leave. yeah, you can unfollow, <laughs> right, right? Right, and I don't mean that in a mean way. No. Like, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. Yeah. But I'm also sort of like, that's totally fine. Totally. If it's not for you, you may leave. Because there are comedians that are super successful that are not for me. Totally. I don't have to follow that. Well, in, in, on the internet, there's not like a finite amount of shelf space that exists. It's yeah. not like you're stealing someone else's spot. Uh, right. and, you know, I mean, maybe very literally on a timeline, like you mm. might be showing up above someone yep. else, but like, you know, there's an infinite, I don't know how many podcasts there are, but there's yeah. hundreds of thousands At of them out there. Trillion, yeah, think. yeah, exactly. In tech, sorry. In tech, that's right. And, and, uh, and so it's like, hey, if it, if you want to hear it, great. And if you don't, right. and if you don't there's other, also totally yeah, fine. totally fine. Yeah. And, and so, both what the reason I wanted to come back to that point is that I don't know what kind of stuff I will want to make in six months or a year. I have some general ideas, but I want to make sure that the audience I'm building, that the people who are along for the ride are going to be just as stoked about that as they have been about everything else I've been making. Totally. And so that has been a very intentional choice to sometimes push myself to put stuff out that I'm like, I don't uh, I don't think this is going to get a lot of views, but I'm going to put it out anyway. Yeah. And that's important because I feel like having a a, being able to uh, put stuff out that's authentic to me, even if it isn't just like jokes about APIs and working from home is super important. You know, I mean, you know what you know, the hits like, you know, what's going to work. Sure. uh, And I guess it's continuing to feel challenged by doing other stuff. That was sort of what I felt in even doing this Mm. was like. I sort of uh, not got bored with Twitter. That's 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 wrong because I still enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. But like I sort of figured out plus or minus what I could do to continue to grow sure. and the style of jokes that people liked and all that. And this was a much more um, I, I, you're exposed in a very different way, like the mm. level of uh, depth that you need to have. You're not uh, constrained to 140 or 280 characters. No. And like one thing, there's intonation, there's mm-hmm. nuance, there's. Uh, you're you're just much more exposed and it's different. And oh, yeah. so that's what I think's been interesting uh, for me as an exercise of doing this. And and it evolves. I think people like seeing things evolve over time. Obviously, yeah. I I, I uh, murdered my two co-hosts. Right. And, you know, <laughs> that that was a, you know, Game of Thrones kind yeah. of Machiavellian decision. And when you by called me. me to say I need to dispose of two bodies, I mean, I was there for you. Totally, yeah, totally. 100%. It's amazing uh, when you anchor, they don't float <laughs> to the Hudson. Yeah, no, the top. By the way, can we talk about how you 
literally wouldn't even come on my podcast for almost a year. And now you have your own podcast. I know. Well, you know, it is interesting. It's back to that that point where I felt uh, I felt like I had become something of a character yeah. within what I what I was known for on Twitter. Right. And I wasn't yet comfortable with what being fully exposed mm-hmm. to the nuance of oh, yeah. the intonation of my voice and uh, <laughs> like what I what what I say and yep. I mean a tweet you can delete right yeah. uh, or you can whatever you can check with four friends and say hey is this funny or not yeah uh, but once you press publish on this uh or a video or whatever it is a podcast you're totally exposed right oh it's out there baby (laughs) it's out there and if you misspoke it's not like you don't get to go back and edit that word that that word out in the same way right and uh and so i was uh uncomfortable with what that was going to look like yeah especially when it's someone else doing the editing yes i'm so much more comfortable recording on my show than on someone else's yes because ultimately i have control over the edit and if i say something where I'm like, oh, I should not have said that. Yeah. That I can cut it out. Yeah. Whereas you are making yourself more vulnerable when you're you're put, you're putting your trust in someone else's hands. Totally. Yeah. It's amazing. And I want how you much to you... think about that. Yeah, I know. I, I want know, you to yeah. really I want you to let yeah, that sink in. Yeah, a lot of in. a lot of power that I that I will wield once the that's once right. we stop recording here. <laughs> I uh no, I do think that's an interesting it's an interesting point that um yeah you're I, I mean it is amazing the amount of editing that you can do. I uh, whatever mm-hmm. I see now ha- it sort of makes you aware to how television or how, you know, media or whatever can manipulate. Even you could be saying something, right? Yeah. And I'm not even talking deep fakes. Yeah. I'm talking like <laughs> you could you could like slightly edit the cut yeah. to make someone sound smarter or dumber yes. based on what was actually said, right? Oh, yeah. And with great, with to just to quote uh, Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. You know, I think like with my show, it's super important that the integrity and the intention of what someone is trying to say is always maintained if I'm going to make a cut. Yep. And that's super important because that's what I would want someone totally. you want to do for me. Do unto others. Yeah, exactly. yeah exactly. The golden rule of podcasting. Go- yeah, that's right. That's right. What? Uh, so how has the experience of actually starting a podcast been? You've gotten a lot of interesting uh, guests oh, I love on. It. And, yeah. I really, I really am astounded and also humbled. How many times can I say humbled on this podcast? A lot. A you're, lot. Okay. You're, I'm just you're among VCs, so we're used I, to being humble. Yeah. yeah. Um I'm super humbled by how many incredible guests I've been able to have on um you know obviously people like Mark Cuban and Chris Saka those were Kara Swisher these are like big guests yeah, for me. Yeah. Um Logan Bartlett etc. Yeah, exactly. Um but you know I, the process of doing it has been so rewarding. Like I love tech and business. It's just I really enjoy it. My yep. brain feels like it's split in half. I've got half of my brain that just wants to make people laugh and have fun and bring joy. And then the other half of my brain loves looking at spreadsheets and growth metrics and figuring out what else I can do to run my business more efficiently. Yeah. I have a beautiful notion. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can imagine. And so the podcast gets to tickle both sides of that where I'm fully independent. I'm not with a network. I do my own sponsorship deals. I book my own guests. I have a team that helps me with some op stuff and I have some support, obviously, on the engineering and production side. But I get to run that like it's its own little business. Yep. And that is so satisfying. And and I get to sit down and have 45 minute long chats with people that I wouldn't have dreamed I would get down, get to sit down and talk to. And I don't have to ask them about their job. Yeah. Oh, my God. What a treat. Yeah. I mean, it's so joyful to sit down with somebody, even if it's even if I know them because I admire their career. I get to sit down and actually talk to them about them. And no joke, I have legit I've made like good friends who were guests on my podcast are now good friends of mine. That's funny. Oh, yeah. Like Alexia Bonazza is a great example. Really? Yes. She and I connected on what? Clubhouse, Twitter, something yeah. like that. I thought she was cool. I knew her work. I knew, you know, former TechCrunch. Now she's uh, an investor and stuff. And she came on my podcast and we just immediately clicked. And huh. now she's a good friend of mine. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's interesting the amount of... Um, like depth that you get to have in a different format, mm-hmm. right? That's one of the things I, I've, for the most part, I, I've pushed back on things being like off limits, not because I really want to press like into different subject yeah. areas, but uh, I don't know. It, it sort of feels like a free flowing conversation that yeah. I want to have. And to some extent, I feel I, I'm not a journalist, right? And mm. so I don't feel like an obligation to get to the root of a matter. But Interesting. But at the same time, I do want to be able to ask about interesting stuff and i if i get someone that's interesting to sit down with me yeah. 
I sort of feel an obligation to ask some of those things because it's not my pretense isn't Mm. everything that's not to do with their job, right? Mine is, hey, let's have an easy conversation about all this stuff. And I don't know, if if you're known for something, then I've got to be able to ask about it, right? Or if it's something that someone's going to say, hey, why did you sit there? I I don't care if like my journalist friends are going to say, hey, you don't have like the integrity of our institution or whatever, but I do feel that I I can't pull punches if I'm sitting across from someone. 100%. Even I feel that way. Yeah. I feel that way even though I don't ask about work. And in some ways, I feel it more so because I don't. When I think about who I bring on the podcast, I am very afraid of being uh, Jimmy Fallon ruffling Trump's hair before the election, where I don't want to bring someone on who either has uh, done things that are damaging to people and not be able to ask them about totally. it. Totally. Like Kara Swisher can sit down with somebody who has, we could call it like a controversial persona or whatever, because she's going to ask them about it directly. Yeah. Whereas I'm like, do you believe in ghosts? Yeah. I No, <laughs> no, by the way. I, yeah. I No, I, I feel, I, I 100% feel that that tension and that, that line. Yeah. And there's been people that have been uh, suggested to me of like, oh, you should bring them on. And either because, hey, I don't want to uh, do a full deep dive into oppo research to right. like push back on the views mm. right especially if you're talking to someone that has like really deep nuanced views of yeah. like controversial topics yes. and i'm like hey i just i can't spend the next two weeks learning <laughs> about like all the counterpoints to like sure. yeah and so it is an interesting dichotomy with all of that uh now you're doing so so you have the podcast yes you're you're doing some sponsor videos you're mm-hmm. doing some like advisory or ta- what's the business you don't have a fund which seems to be the <laughs> thing that that a lot of people do i have a fund I, I i'm doing the reverse i think it's an easier path that i'm taking which is yeah. having a fund yeah. and then doing this on the side yeah. versus a lot of people uh are doing the reverse now mm-hmm. where they're doing the hard part of the job and mm-hmm. then doing the fund yeah is that something you've been asked about like hey can i give you money to invest in some of the startups that you get exposed to totally and how flattering yeah totally you know that people would trust my judgment on that and i i do think that i have a perspective that could be valuable totally. in making some of those and and early ability to bend the be helpful like actually exactly. bend the curve for some of these companies add value yeah. love to add value yeah i've heard um, about that yeah <laughs> you should try it yeah um the thing is i we, we, it would not be shocking for me to one day have a fund. Am I going to regret saying that? I no, don't I don't think so. But honestly, like it would that wouldn't be a crazy surprise, right? What's the downside of you saying that? It's like uh, more people are going to ask to give you money. You know? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. That, uh, yeah. All these LPs. I can't believe I said that. Now everyone's so trying to give me money. Yeah. Um, okay. But the thing is, like I like anything, like what I'm doing right now, I want to do like a really, really good job. And I already feel that my focus is split between all those different things that I mentioned I do. I didn't even mention the fact that I do stand-up comedy. Mm. That's a whole other thing. That takes a lot of time. And it's hard. It's it's really hard. (laughs) What do your stand-up comedian friends, by the way, uh, think about like your tech world? They're definitely like, I I think they're aware that I'm like built a little different. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, I can imagine. Yeah, and showing up in a blazer to the club. Yeah, like. I, was, you know, <laughs> reference back, thankfully, uh, Mark Cuban has done a good job of like democratizing information about venture. I can, mm. That's always my shortcut when I'm explaining to someone that like doesn't, I'm yeah. like, you've seen Shark Tank, right? Yes, yes, I'm yes, like, yes, yeah, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm a shark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what, what's their perspective on the tech ecosystem though you have to get a lot of people that are like far on the outside in the stand-up world right it's super interesting because you know i think like the the middle of this venn diagram though is like building a persona or building like a public brand and mm. so oftentimes the people that i'm comedy friends with they don't necessarily know why i have a following of people in tech or why my content is focused on tech they just know that like i have a following or like i do comedy And so it's fun because when I meet comedians, they have no idea Hmm. sometimes that I spent seven years in the tech world. You know, they just know like, oh, yeah, you make those videos and I see you around sometimes. And so it's kind of fun because then in the tech world, I get to I just get to I'm like a utility player. I can go back and forth. And it's I feel so satisfied by having both worlds as a part of my life because. I really don't think if I was just in one, I would feel fully satisfied. Yeah. I've lived in the tri-state area now for like 25 years, but yeah. my family's all from the South. Right. So yeah, I'm yeah. like selectively Southern, I would say. <laughs> you know, you're selectively tech sense. at this point. I de- yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but the one, the the reason, the thing about the fund that I I also feel is like, 
if I started a fund, it would be a secret, I think. Really? Yeah. I, I don't know that I can bring myself to make a some personal news tweet. Yeah. I really think it would be like a secret fund. And I think that in order, like all my comms would go down on like signal or like text. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just Disappearing. Make, it would just be super easy. It would be simple. You could put a check in. I would send updates, but I would be I I'm hopeful that my ultimate my final form is not like a some personal news tweet. God, I'm saying that now. I know. And then Famous last I, words. It's literally I know. like I can We're gonna see link back the smash this cut now. Uh, yeah, I'm going to, yeah. How it started, how yeah. it's going. Dear future some Alexis, personal, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, some personal <laughs> news. Uh, now, what's your perspective having been on the outside, but also on the inside a little bit over the course of the last, whatever, uh, mm -hmm. 18 months? What's your perspective on the state of the tech ecosystem, the rhetoric around mm. it. You've moved from San Francisco to New York. Yes. And I'm back, baby. Uh, like what's your yeah, what what are your what are your feelings to tech? You mentioned loving it, which I is do. not something a ton of people admit publicly these days. I <laughs> Isn't think. it? I know. It's weird. It's a controversial tech. I'm a contrarian. I so was gonna you say, yeah, Logan. yeah. <laughs> pro tech. Pro tech, pro health insurance, famously controversial comedian Alexis Gosh. Gay. Well, here's the thing. You know, we're recording this in uh in in May 2022. Yeah. Wow, I forgot when it, what time it is. Yeah, um, yeah. But the reason I bring that up is that something I say about the tech ecosystem now, it's going to be like very different over the next year, few years, because we are, of course, at the end of... <laughs> Totally. I don't want to be pessimistic, of course, and say like, oh, the, I think it's safe to say. But the, I would say the consequences of some of our more laissez faire attitude towards funding and investing and starting companies and valuations is certainly coming to a close yep. or at least coming to a bit of a downturn. And so I don't know what the tech culture and what the tech dialogue and rhetoric is going to sound like. My ears are certainly my antennas are up. My antenna? Antennae? Yeah, antenna. Antenna. I'm listening is yeah, the point. Yeah. Because we are moving away. I think we will see it moving away from some of the bravado around funding announcements. It, you're not gonna be it's not gonna be as easy, right? To totally. make some of those big impressive claims and stuff like that. And so I'm curious to see how people in tech are going to still hype themselves up, you know? Totally. I, I wonder if it'll be like just hyper humility. Do you know what I mean? Totally. Because yeah. that's the thing in tech too, is to just be like I'm failing in public. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think that is, it's a good point. I, I think a lot of the like more cringy things over the course of the last couple of years were a function of the exuberance, right? Mm. And uh, and just that do no wrong that existed. And so yeah. it's it, it'll be interesting now that there's going to be, there there is this pullback happening. It'll be interesting to see how tech gets covered, yes. right? Because we're also going through this period of time where tech is being covered in a way that was historically reserved for Hollywood or sports or <laughs> right? politics, right? Seriously. And it, you know, rightfully so. Yes. There, you have these people that are uh, insanely wealthy and influential. And so it seems and like- And the a very, platforms that they've created and the services they've created- The have impact now on the world is just crazy. Integral to our lives instead of like some silly, silly little thing in a garage. It's totally. like, no, it's Uber, the thing that- millions of Americans use every day to totally. get around. And like how many employees are, are made on it, yes, right? 100%. And so I think it's, but it'll be interesting as those two things are happening with the rhetoric and all of that. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly how, I, you could see those two things coming together and having it be really negative and dark, or you yeah. could see like more of a reset to- I don't think it's going to go negative and dark. From I, a coverage I standpoint? For, well, from a coverage standpoint, that's, that's actually a great question. I, I don't I think it will be hard to keep kicking tech when it's down from a coverage standpoint. Like, I think that lots of layoffs are happening right yeah. now. Right. And uh, Equ Equity Pod, I think the title of their episode last week was like layoffs don't happen to companies. They happen to people. Yeah. Like you have to remember that there are real people on the end of some of these decisions. 100%. So I think the coverage will respect that. But it, my perspective is always more from like, how are tech people talking about this? How are tech people talking about themselves and their companies? And something that I'm very curious to see is actually the relationship between VCs and founders, because mm. it kind of feels like we're in for a bit of a reckoning. Oh, well, I, <laughs> I'm interested in, in, in what way you mean that. I agree, but I'm interested in what way. Okay, so what I mean is that <laughs> this is not referring to anyone in particular, but I feel that the culture, of course, from like the founder perspective has been very like, which VC will take the honor of investing $20 million in my company? Yeah. 
And now... These are things you can say that I can't, what you're about to say right now. Yes, okay. Well, and now I'm just a little bit curious when the funding climate is not so friendly to founders. What the Are we going to go back to the flip of founders really having to hustle to prove that they are the right founder instead of what I'm seeing now, which is VCs, uh, you know, present company (laughs) included, having to find ways to differentiate themselves and build brands so that founders will graciously accept their funding. I, you know, I think we went from 100% on one side to 100% of the other side. And I I think it's going to reach a little bit of an equilibrium that's healthy on on both sides where there is mutual respect. Some of the stories that I had heard (laughs) of, you know, just the last year, it's been pretty wild. Yeah, Uh, I mean, I've heard, I hear that stuff too, right? Totally, like 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 private plane flights to to you know different islands and like different celebrities and hubris of being like coming out of demo day, being like, here are the terms. I'm not negotiating. Send me a docusign. Totally. What? Yeah. That's a, real, that's a thing. Yeah. It, it's going to keep the pendulum is going to keep speaking. I think it's been good and healthy for VCs to get a dose of, uh, you know, whatever humble pie dealt to them by founders <laughs> over the course of the last year. I, I do think it probably went too far one way. And so yeah. hopefully how's your sp- bicycle clown. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, what about New York? How's it been to be back? Oh my God. Whew. Oh, I'm so happy to be really? back in New York. You know, people, I will say this. I don't hate San Francisco. Yeah. I'd like to go publicly on the record. Wow. Because often people, uh, I meet people and they're like, oh man, you so you really don't, you don't like San Francisco. Yeah. That's not true at all. People seem to view it as a zero sum kind of yes. thing. Like you can't, you can't respect one geo uh, and another. You right. have to pick one and totally. dunk on San Francisco. Which I, I, there's plenty to dunk on in SF. Um, there's plenty to dunk on in New York as well. And then also I think the, I think tech becoming so, oh my God, I'm going to say decentralized, but whatever. Yeah, that I think works. Tech becoming decentralized outside of the major hubs. I think also there's a lot of, you know, opportunity there for um, for levity as well. But the thing is, like, in Sa- the difference for me personally between San Francisco and New York is that in San Francisco, I never felt like I fit. And in New York, I'm from Connecticut. I'm from the East Coast. I went to NYU. I, I've lived in New York for several years before. Like, this feels more like my city where I fit in. Yeah, that's great. I uh, well, I'm glad we were able to do this. Anything I didn't hit in in all of the stuff? I mean, I, I I quite literally wouldn't be doing this without uh you sort of helping me initially figuring out what software to use and how to go into this. And so I uh, yeah, if anyone's listening, they're not only listening to you, but this wouldn't be a thing without <laughs> you telling me like what tools to figure out and all that stuff. Wow. So thank you for uh, thank you for all the help in getting oh this going. Oh my gosh, you're so welcome, Logan. Wow, Ernest on Maine once again. I, you know, we'll uh, I, we'll see if ultimately I thank you when all is said and done here. Yeah, you yeah, know, like I right know. now I'm feeling pretty good, but yeah. uh, it could be six months and I it's just a really dark hole. I, I, no one will come on. I'm canceled for some reason. I say something <laughs> on the, you know, this you is made my it line my show about without the, getting canceled, which but, I thought was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was nice. you gave me you gave me you gave me uh, some editorial control yes, that did. we didn't ultimately use, but I uh, right. you at least checked in with of me. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, I, as long as I stay away from like the Uyghurs, uh, I think you know that was what got, got Chamath canceled for a little bit. So as long as I don't weigh in on like humi- humanitarian crises, that I th- does seem like a good maybe. Just I think that's right. Yeah, I, I I think that's the one that has gotten people in trouble thus far. So, so. what you're saying is that you don't care about humanitarian crises. crises. That is below my line. What I heard was that Logan Bartlett famously doesn't care about humanitarian issues. That's right. Yeah, that's okay. right. If that it doesn't sense. benefit the pod, then 100%. yeah. <laughs> I am so appreciative to have come on. This was such a treat. This and is fun. I feel like honored that anything I did or anything I shared with you has helped you do this because I'm a fan and I'm super excited. And every time I see you're doing well, I'm like, oh, yes, I love that. I, lo- I literally love seeing my friends do well. You know, it's it's fun. Uh, I think some people that don't do this stuff view it as zero sum that like, hey, I can't that we're competing for spots on oh, yeah and it's just not that right i no. mean i guess it's some some extent people will choose what they want to listen to 100%. but i i have offered no one's taking me up on it but like if someone wants to get a podcast going i've offered to like help of course come out with a little primer Always. of like what to do it it's actually not that easy right no to, no it's not easy yeah and uh but i think the more people doing this the better so there will not no one is going to do a better job at being you and creating stuff from your perspective than you are. And so in that way, there is no such thing as true competition. You might be creating a similar show to someone else, 
talking about similar topics, having similar guests, but ultimately like you're the only one that can do the best job at like your perspective. And I think about that all the time in comedy and in whatever else I do in my podcast and stuff, because if I take too much time to look around and compare myself, who does that benefit? Yeah. Nobody. Um, so we'll all, I, I look upon you and I'm very, very excited about everything you're yeah, doing. Yeah, well, thank you. But again, don't um, forget where you came from. I know, I know, I know. I uh, <laughs> I will not. I, I You certainly deserve when a lot I of credit for When I come back for a job in tech, I just want you to remember. <laughs> I 100% will. Uh, I, again, be careful what you say on here. And People are going to be coming LP back. Check. And the first LP check. Okay, I'll do both of that. Record. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for doing this. <laughs> thanks, Logan. This is so fun. That concludes the 17th episode of Cartoon Avatars. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Next week, we have a, uh, another really exciting guest, um, someone that I've uh, wanted to have a conversation with for a long time. So excited for you to hear that, as well as uh, two really good uh, co-hosts that um, uh, have been fan favorites. So excited for everyone to hear. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Yeah.